Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 215, Quality of Life. How can publishers enhance the board game experience? I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We're live on Twitch Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, and we love when you folks join us for any of our recordings. Tonight, we've got an interesting question about quality of life improvements in board games. After a talk about that, we've got a few reviews, including the new At The Ready expansion for Disney Sorcerer's Arena, Epic Alliances, Birds of a Feather, and Siege of Valeria campaign expansion. We then wrap up with the Bellhops tabletop, where we share what we've been playing lately. Find links to the games we mention and other related things through our show notes, which you can find at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 215. Links found here may be to affiliate programs which help support this show, while some products discussed during this program are provided by rev- uh, for review by publishers. Let's start things by taking a trip to the suggestion box. Welcome to this week's suggestion box. Here we share some feedback and other comments we've gotten on our content over the last couple of weeks. Since we skipped this segment last show, this is going to be a bit longer than usual, as we've gotten a lot of feedback in the last couple of weeks. So first off, thank you everyone for the birthday anniversary well wishes. We got a lot of people congratulating us on hitting five years, and thanks to all of you for that. First up, we have Invincible009, who commented on one of our older episodes on engine builders to say, I really have a pet peeve of calling Wingspan an engine builder. It is a tableau builder that allows to increase your basic actions, but in no way it has the possibility of activating X to do Y and then Z, and come back to X. Wingspan adds to your main actions, but you don't get a chain reaction as you would in, say, Race for the Galaxy, which is both a tableau and an engine builder. Thanks for the podcast, guys. Well, thanks for the comment, uh, Invincible. Well, it seems, I gotta say, we have different views on what an engine builder is, but I do appreciate the feedback. Like, to me, building an engine isn't about building combos. To me, that's combo building. There are combo building games out there. To me, building an engine is about things ramping up and getting more powerful during the game. game. And to me, Wingspan is honestly the perfect example of this. The more you take an action, the better it gets. Each round builds upon the last. Well, next, a comment from Martin Vasquez on Azul Queen's Garden. My first run with this was a disaster, (laughs) but I figured it out right near the end. It's a very different experience from the original, but like you said, very satisfying. Well, thanks, Martin. Yeah, I still find Queen's Garden to be the most opaque of the Azul games. It's not really obvious what you should be doing and why you should be doing it until you play the game, usually more than once. Now, I play quite a few games of this now, and I still don't feel I'm good at the game, but my scores have been constantly improving, so I must be learning something. Well, it seems quite a bit of our older content somehow got people's attention, like this comment on our review of Masters of the Universe, the role-playing game from FASA. Andrew commented, I just stumbled on this review. I got this game for my birthday back in 85 or 86 from my parents. I begged them to play for a couple of days, and finally they said, the rules are too complicated. After that, they stuck it in the storage shed, which was destroyed by a hurricane a couple of years later. I never so much as popped out the standees. All right, I have to start with our usual warning. Yes, FASA, F-A-S-A, the big company behind Shadowrun, Battletech, and Star Trek RPGs and Star Trek games did put out a Masters of the Universe role-playing game. No, you absolutely should not run over to eBay or Noble Knight or Facebook Marketplace to try to find yourself a copy. That way leads to frustration and madness. This is not a good game. This is not even a complete game, and it is no way at all a playable game. All this is is half a game that was rushed to the market before it was finished and is a complete and total mess. Now, what you can do is go read my review and find out why I'm warning you away from this piece of history. Now, as for your comment, Andrew, I am sorry to say you didn't really miss out on anything but a piece of history. And no, Joe Swick, I'm still not interested in getting rid of my copy. Next, let's go into some expansions. Here are a few comments that came from our topic of must-have board game expansions. Charles Baruch says, Waterdeep needs the expansions. Cindy Robertson commented to say, 
King of Tokyo, I always use power-ups. Sentinels of the Multiverse, I mix it all together. Eldritch Horror is more fun with more expansions. So many of my games, I just have everything together and don't really think about the expansions. Darren Drummond says Machikoro is almost unplayable without the Harbor expansion. And Daniel Anderson the win uh, says the Winter expansion for Dice Kingdoms of Valeria really is a great addition to the game, much more challenging. Well, thanks, Charles, Cindy, Sharon, and Daniel. I agree with everything said here, though I personally missed out on playing Machikoro without the Harbor because I had heard it wasn't good without it and only played a later version. I think it was the Big Lights, Big City version, which basically includes that. So I did uh, miss out on that original failure. And I can't argue with any of the rest of these. Well, with Fighting Fantasy Adventures launching on GameFound yesterday, now it seems to be a good time to share some info we got and comments we received on our preview. So first off, I have a couple of notes from Cassie Simpson. Um, she works for Wallace Designs. That's the publisher of the game with some important information that I think is, is worth sharing. Um, first off, thanks for the preview, Mo. The final game will look a lot different from when you opened it up. All of the artwork is being overhauled. Well, I was on the game found today, and I've got to say it looked great. Uh, the old one looked old school. What we had looked very drab, all gray dungeons. Everything now looks very bright and colorful, and I love the new look. Now, another thing to note is that Steve and Ian, those uh, Steve Jackson and Ian Livingston, the original authors of the Fighting Fantasy books, are presenting the game. Their name is on it, and basically they got the license. They haven't actually been involved in the gameplay. That's all Martin Wallace. Now, the other comment I got from Cassie was, thanks for the video. We've since decided to include the sample adventure as a bonus for people to enjoy, but it will have all new art. We're going to be making wooden counters, so they'll be a little easier to handle. And yes, we definitely expect people to restart or just undo if the players are getting a little too frustrated. Along with this info from the publisher, we did get some comments from fans as well, like Rowan Massing, who commented, Good video. I can't wait to back this game for a shot at feeling 38 years younger, at least until paragraph 400 when I have to return to the real world. Nice. City of Thieves, Warlock, Death Trap Dungeon, so many classics, and I hope we get to see them all with this exciting project. Al Habrika wrote, I played Fighting Fantasy and Grail Quest mostly, but really enjoyed Way of the Tiger and Duel Master. Adrian Young wrote, Very interesting. Seems strange the quest was to find three coins to open a chest and not three keys. Also, mm -hmm. if a player's character dies, is the player out of the game? And I understand it does well emulating the game books, dying and then starting the adventure from the start, but nowadays I'm not sure how enticing this would be. Thanks for the review. And then Eggman Jr. wrote, I played many of the classic game books, but not all. Back in the 80s, it wasn't as easy to find a series of books like this as it is today. You had to go to the bookstore and hope something new had come into stock. I think I played around 12 to 14 of them. Such a different world today. Well, first off, thanks Wallace Designs for keeping in touch and letting us know how things are progressing. It's good to hear about these changes, though now I kind of feel bad for spoiling the whole water thing. But oh well, it just means anyone who actually listens to our preview gets a free tip for the first starter adventure. Also, thanks Rowan, Habrika, Adrian, and Eggman for your feedback. Now, as far as character death goes, in the preview version we played, it was permanent. But the rulebook does have rules for dragging bodies out of rooms and hinted at the fact there is some way to bring characters back, at least in some of the adventures, we just didn't see that. Overall, I'm just really curious to see how the crowdfunding campaign goes. Seems to be good so far. Well, as of yesterday, they were already at 162% funded, so it's well on track to do well this time around. Well, that's it for tonight's comments. We appreciate all of your comments, even if we don't highlight them at the start of an episode. All right, one reminder before we get to our main topic. There has been an update to our five-year birthday giveaway. So during the first week after the giveaway was launched, we were getting a number of people pointing out that it wasn't working right on mobile. While we've had an issue with specific phones or browsers in the past where a couple people have complained and we just pointed them to the desktop version, this time it's much more widespread and we felt we had to do something about it. 
So after spending far too long trying to fix things, we decided to drop Rafflecopter and switch to a different platform for the giveaway altogether and relaunch the entire thing on Gleam. Don't worry, folks. Those of you that entered on the old Rafflecopter widget still get to keep all of your entries. Deanna was able to export those over, so we didn't lose any entries. Now, as a bonus for joining the giveaway early, we welcome you to enter on the new version as well. Consider it thanks for jumping in early. Now, Gleam offers us a way to better integrate the giveaway with things like social media and our newsletter, as well as allowing for viral entries, where you get five entries for everyone who signs up using your link. Overall, it's just a much better product than Rafflecopter, but that does come at a cost. Now, thankfully, Gleam lets you swap between tiers. So now we're paying for one month of Gleam, and then we'll swap back to free until our next giveaway. Due to all of this mess, we've decided to extend the giveaway for one more week to make up for the week where people were finding it difficult to enter. Mm -hmm. The giveaway will now end on August 24th. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from fan of the show and patron, Pax the Paladin, who writes, what are the quality of life improvements that publishers make to games that you appreciate most? Inspired by the gratitude I feel towards Stonemeyer games every time I consult the box cover diagram to put away Wingspan. Well, thanks for the great question, Pax, and for being one of our awesome Patreon patrons. You too could help support the show and help us cover the cost of things like Gleam by going to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Now, I thought this would be a fun discussion to have, though I am sad to say I still haven't played a physical copy of Wingspan. So I haven't seen that particular quality of life improvement to comment on it, but I have seen something similar. So by quality of life improvements, we mean things that improve the gameplay of a game, but that aren't actually required to yeah. play the game. The game would be perfectly playable and functional without them. They are things that improve the gameplay experience, which can very well also improve your enjoyment of the game. Yeah, these are things that it's not a, a rule change. It's not additional miniatures. It's not um, extra dice included in the set. Well, extra dice might count. Um, what we're looking at here are more ephemeral things, things that aren't required to sit down and play the game. The game would work perfectly fine without them. As a really good example of something we've been playing, playing recently, though, though that to me isn't one of the best ones out there, but there is absolutely no reason Boop needs a quilted board to be able to play it or even having the cat theme. That quilted board is a quality of life improvement. It's only there. So the player's like, oh my God, it's got a quilted board. Look, it looks like I'm jumping on a bed. So I think we're going to talk about some of the quality of life improvements we've seen and the ones we would like to see more of, the, the, the ones we most enjoy finding in a game. And I'm going to start with what Pax said, uh, with the box cover diagram. Now, I hadn't seen this before until recently, and it was with Castle Panic, the big box. And this is so uncommon that I tried to fill the box on my own a couple times and failed. Then went online to Google how to fill it, was going through a thread of people sharing how they sorted it, only to get two pages in on Board Game Geek when someone said, look at the box top. And everyone in the thread was like, what? And sure enough, the box top for Castle Panic, big box, second edition, technically, I assume first also had this as a diagram of where to put everything in the box. Now, this in particular, I, I'd like, yes, box top, awesome. But just that diagram, a diagram that tells you where to put the inserts and where to put the components in the trays and where to sort the cards and where the dice should sit in the box is awesome. It doesn't have to be the box top, though I got to say it's a brilliant place to put it. Another example would be uh, Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy actually has it on the side of the box, where when you lift the lid of the game, if you have it turned the right way, it shows how to put all the trays inside. Other games I own, I've had a sheet that says it. One of them, Anachrony, has a book that literally shows you how to layer all the different things inside and what goes where. Just some way that tells me how to sort it. I don't know how many games I've gotten where it's got some insert in it, and I look at it, and I'm like, I have no idea what you expect me to put where. Like, uh, an example of that would be the My Little Pony deck building game, which we talked a lot about in the recent episodes. I found a way to fit everything, and it works great, but I have no idea if that's how the designer intended me to use it. 
But while it might increase your printing costs, it won't really add to materials. And especially with that inside of the box cover, it's otherwise wasted space. It's yeah. always nice to see when it's used by designers and publishers for some purpose that benefit the players. Though, I suppose it could be argued that those box toppers out there might get annoyed. Yeah, they can just write over top of the image or something. <laughs> Find somewhere else to put it. I, box toppers, I don't I wonder how many people actually box top. I, I kind of want to know that. If you're a box topper, hit us up. I want to know. Absolutely. I thought about it for a while. I thought it'd be a cool piece of history to be able to pull out a game and see all the different people I played it with. But I think what I'd rather do is just like come up with a sheet and put it in there. Maybe that's what we can do as a, a giveaway for signing up for our newsletter. We'll make a box topper sheet that people can tape into the top of their box. Mm -hmm. That way it works. So you just tape it in or leave it in your box. Now to me, the next level from giving me a diagram of where to put everything in an insert or, you know, not necessarily even an insert, but like any type of board organization, it can be, you know, trays that come out, you pass around is have the insert, have, have the thing. Tell me what goes where I love seeing this. Now I've seen this done where the plastic that the box insert is molded from and the various trays are molded from are, is literally molded to show the various different symbols of like whatever the resource symbols or the playing piece symbols or the different faction symbols i've also seen it done with stickers that you put onto the tray i've also seen it with an overlay that goes inside the insert and once and i thought this was utterly brilliant and i think it goes back to like a classic game called titan is an underlay where you put this piece of paper under your plastic tray and then it shows you what goes everywhere inside it and like that's not a new thing like that's an older game that does this and i think it's brilliant yeah and this could be done far more often as there have been a number of games we've seen where each mini has its own special space to keep it safe and tightly secured, but the difference between them is minuscule, so you don't realize that you've until you've got the last one and it won't go in the, the spot that they're all placed wrong and you need to juggle yes. them around until each one is in its proper spot randomly. Essentially. Uh -huh. Yeah, I definitely had that one. Pro tip, if a game doesn't include one of these, when you, before you take your minis out, grab your phone, take a snap a picture. And then if you're really fancy, then go print that, put it in the box. But I did that for, um, I think it was Villainous, Disney Villainous. I, I actually took a picture to figure out where they would go back because there were a couple that I couldn't tell the difference. Yeah, I forget what it is, but I, I clearly remember uh, a, a couple of games where it's like you've got like five or six minis and, and they all sort of fit into each one, mm -hmm. but not quite. Yes. And so if you get three wrong, you know, your fourth one is never going to fit and you've got to yep. juggle them. Sorcerer. Sorcerer from CG CGE was one. Yep. And uh, Big Trouble in Little China. I remember that being a problem with as well. Or like we had no clue where to yep. put them back. Now, let's take a step back, though, because we're kind of jumping the gun here. We're jumping ahead because honestly, just having an insert or some form of component organization can be a huge quality of life improvement. Game trays, bits, bins, uh, trays that hold every, like player trays that have all their pieces. Um, anything else, bowls include, you don't tend to get bowls. I use bowls. Um, uh, any of those things that help sort the components, even a well-designed cardboard box insert can be better than no insert or better than your prof insert that's created just to get the game shipped to you in good shape. These things help to get games played more often, which the Bellhop's first law is the best games in your collections are the ones that actually get played. So anything that helps with that is appreciated. These can help with setup and tear down time, which is a huge part of modern games. And they can also make the game flow or play better during the game because it's easier to reach things, it's easier to find things, and actually improve the actual gameplay experience. Now, to be fair, though, that's not always the case. There are times when an insert can actually slow things down and get in your way. So mm -hmm. publishers should not just think that, oh, we're going to put an insert in here. That will solve all of our problems. No, <laughs> if you don't think it through, you can actually make it worse than just having a trough would be there and letting the players figure out their own solution. Yeah, and sometimes the way they, uh, I've, I've had a couple publishers put out these inserts and more often like bit spins where they sort things different than I would. And I'm like, why wouldn't you just put all the money in one spot? You don't have to split up the ones, the fives, the tens, and put them into hard to reach places. 
just dump all the money in one spot, for example, or sorting, having a tray with the six different player colored cubes on that tray. While meanwhile, having separate things for all the rest of the player pieces. I'm like, well, we, we're just going to pass this tray around and take them. Why not instead have five different trays for the five different players? So it's, it's definitely something I've seen. Yeah. So while we love having bowls handy and we always do in our games, yeah. not needing them is a far better option. A game that comes with complete with easy to play accessories isn't as rare as it once was, but it's still not quite as common, especially with yep. non kickstarted games. Now, another one I'm going to call out that it's a minor version of this that I always appreciate. And I usually call it out in the unboxing. If you're not going to give me an insert, give me baggies. Yes, I have a ton of baggies, but I hate going through my bag of baggies to find the proper size. Give me the proper size baggies in the game. Do what I just said. Make sure you give me one baggie per player so I can put all of their stuff, everything you need at the start of the game in one bag so I can hand it to them and give me other bags to sort the rest of the stuff. Uh, baggies are better than nothing. While I love a nice big insert, I also understand that's very expensive. Baggies are better than nothing. I appreciate any time a publisher includes baggies with their game. And while I have to say Mo may be, you know, somewhat different, uh, not all of us have a bag of baggies of different yes. sizes. Uh, so if you, if you don't provide any, we may end up going with nasty Ziploc bags, which are rarely the best solution. You know, your yeah. snack bags and sandwich bags aren't the right solution for, for the game pretty much ever. So, uh, you think, yeah, uh, some, some people, not everyone has the, the, the monster bag. <laughs> All right. Moving away from, from board game organization. Um, I'm going to go to another one, which is another big one. You know, I'm, I'm going to skip. I'm, I'm going to jump back a sec because we're talking about the stuff that goes in the game. I'm going to call out a, um, a, a one that I call out because I mentioned calling things out on my YouTube channel when I'm doing unboxing. So what I'm going to call out is I always appreciate this is this total quality of life when the designer designs the box so that I can hold it vertically or I can stack it horizontally and I can read it either way. So on two sides of the box, it'll be set up one way and the opposite side of the box will be set up the other way. So I can store my game on my shelves behind me here, either vertically or horizontally, and still be able to read the words on it uh, the right side up. Now, I know that's a little picky thing, but honestly, it's one of those things that gives me great joy when I find it. And it's a little thing, but it's also a little thing for the designer and the publisher. You're going to be printing on all four sides, just making a quick design change so that it's readable horizontally or vertic and vertically isn't a mm -hmm. big change, but it can be a, a very nice touch for players. I'm going to call out something from Pax in the chat room since it is her question we're answering tonight that I, I like here. So it said, love a bunch of extra baggies in a game, but it's this part. It makes me feel like the publisher is thinking from a player perspective. And honestly, that's a big thing about all of the things we're going to mention tonight, that it kind of shows that like the they understand their game's going to get played and how people play their game. So thank you for shouting that out. Now, moving away from the box and organization, uh, probably the biggest one on this entire list, at least for me, and I think for many people, is summary sheets, summary cards, player aids, getting the important information in the game, in the player's hands for easy reference without having to ever have to reference a rule book and flip through it. Now, these have to be useful. You can't put everything that's in the rule book in one one sheet and expect that to be useful it's just too much information it has to be all of the required info for one but not too much and not missing anything i it doesn't help if you give me an icon reference but skip the six main resources because well you should remember them by now uh references for iconography uh big one deanna's favorite is something that lists the phases of the game the phases of around an individual player turn order what are the different steps you go through each round of the game, which is so useful if you're playing a game that has multiples of these. If you have 16 different things you can do on your turn, I'll, I'll call out Terra Mystica. If you have 13 different things you can do on your turn, give me a nice summary card that tells me what all 13 of those are so I don't forget one of them. Uh, another one that I like to see is end game scoring. End game scoring can be a great reminder. Hey, don't forget, it doesn't matter that this is you can battle each other. What's really going to score at the end of the game is who controls the most areas. Yeah, and this is something that shouldn't just be on the back of the manual, the back of the rule book that one person 
has access to throughout the game or you need to keep passing around the table Mm -hmm. give it out there one of the things that i think publishers need to to grasp is if you go to board game geek every game that doesn't already have (laughs) player aids has got files of player player created player aids in that board game geek directory players are demanding this this isn't a a little every you know almost every game you run into gets player Mm -hmm. aids created for it because publishers aren't doing this so why so i mean i guess in some ways publishers are like well they're going to do it they're going to make them for us why should i bother but at the same time it makes a lot of uh, gamers feel more appreciated if they don't have to go digging on board game geek not to mention all the players who aren't at the high end of gaming and don't go to board game geek for every little thing who don't automatically check the forums and check the file lists on board game geek we are the exception we're not the normal gamers i'm sure there are still gamers out there who love games and love modern gaming but have never been to board game geek yeah there's people out there who've never heard of it and even if they did they're gonna go there and go this is way too much i don't I know board game geeks gotten better since we started this show, but that is still one messy site if you don't know how to use it or what you're looking for. I'm pretty sure we actually have an episode called uh, Getting the the Best Most Out of the Geek. So you might want to check that up. I might, I might be off on that, but I'm pretty sure we have an episode on we've how to use We've definitely discussed the geek. I don't yeah. know how deep we've gone in. I, I think there's an episode. I, I don't. I, maybe Deanna can pull this up in the chat room and I'll call it out if I'm correct. I, geeking out on the geek or geeking out about the geek, I think is the name of the episode. So sounds, I'm trying familiar, to remember yes. that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we've covered that, but it is not an easy site, but yes, uh, the fact that people are doing it. Yeah, I get it. Like publishers like now, nah, well, someone will do it better. And we've also called out, I don't even know if they're still around because I haven't checked recently, but esoteric order of gamers for making some of the best ones out there. There are some fantastic ones, but again, I still feel these should be in the box. Um, and, and honestly, some extra cards or sheets of paper shouldn't be that much of a cost increase to scare people away. Um, uh, make them black and white if you have to, if that's that big a deal. And the other thing is include more than one. Like I, I yay, I've got this awesome sheet of iconography. It's fantastic, except it's a five player game and we're all playing simultaneous and need to know all the icons all the time while looking at our hands. Give me five copies. Or at least give me two or something I, like I, that. Ideally, so I can... one for every two players. So you can put them between yeah, two least. players. That's the minimum really acceptable number is one for every two players. Yeah, I agree. Now, another one is taking this uh, potentially a step further, and that is including the information you would normally put on a a player's hands, like in 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 like on a sheet or on a card, instead putting that on a board. So this was something that I learned watching an interview with Ian O'Toole, and it's part of how he designs graphic design for games and boards, is to put as much of the stuff as possible on the board that everyone's already staring at. Because you're going to spend most of it, well, depending on the game, um, you're either going to be staring at your player board or the main board and try to put as much information as possible there. Now, by doing that, it's where everyone can see it, which is pretty cool. Um... And it also makes it so that everyone has equal access and there's no, can you pass that over? Now, of course, the problem is it could get busy. Yeah, the problem, uh, another problem you get to is that uh, depending on how many players there are, the size of your table and the orientation of the board uh, and, and how much information you're trying to get out there, there may be people who are struggling to read, you know, working from the opposite side of the board and, and trying mm-hmm. to read upside down and things like that. So while that is definitely a, a benefit, uh, as we talked, we've been talking a little bit lately about zones, uh, yes. getting it that a, a closer zone to the player is going to be better. You want that mm-hmm. information that they need at hand and not as too far away and, and definitely not into the six or seven, which is the manual or the box. So Deanna has found it. It was a bonus episode released in 2019, Geeking Out About the Geek. Um, It's break room number one. If you go like tabletopbellhop.com slash podcast slash break room number one. If you Google Geeking Out About the Geek Tabletop Bellhop, I'm sure you can find it. All right. Speaking of boards, we're talking about the main board, the player boards and stuff like that. I love when a game comes with dual air boards. I, I, it just... 
I, it, unless it's like absolutely required by the rules, but like I'm talking about like extra bonus board that really wasn't needed to be there. So Katara is a great example of this because I it is the first game I know of that actually comes with two different boards and technically three different sides. So there is a board for four players. Then there's a, you flip that over as a board for three players. And here's the neat one. They actually gave a smaller board for two players. And I love the fact that it's physically smaller. Like it'd be so much easier, I'm sure for publication purposes to keep all the boards the same size. But by having this smaller board, it means the game takes up less space when playing two players. And I'm like, that's really cool. Um, sorry, if I said dual air, I meant dual sided boards. Another example of this is Tapestry. There are two different sides of the board for different player counts. Instead of, I don't know, I, one of the examples is Power Grid. The original Power Grid, when you play with less players, you have to remove regions from the map. Well, instead of doing that, have a dual layer board that gives you the different regions, like just have a two player side and a three player side. Dual sided, not dual layer. Dual <laughs> sided. I keep saying layer, sorry. Dual sided board. I always appreciate that. Another one, though, the Power Grid did get right is you want to double the replayability of your game, put a different board on the other side. So Power Grid, when you buy it, because the game was made in Germany, has a map of the U.S. and has a map of Germany on the back. You get two totally different maps, and anyone who's played Tapestry knows just how different those feel. I definitely love having two-sided boards. Now, I'm going to call it a real quality of life one here, though, and that is Unfair. Unfair has a double-sided board. Or if you all want to sit on the same side of the table, or if you want to sit opposite each other, like honestly, that is the most quality of life improvement. Like not best quality of life, but like the only reason that exists is quality of life. I'm like that is just amazing. They give me a board if we are all sitting together on one side of the table, or we're sitting opposite each other. That's just a cool one. And that was such a simple thing. They only needed one side of the board. They had a yep. blank side, and rather than shipping a blank side, they made a quick little change printed the other side, and now you've got a, a benefit to your players for very little effort and cost on part of the publisher. Now, sticking with boards, but this time actually talking about player boards and dual layer boards, not dual sided boards. Dual layer boards really are awesome. And yeah. not just for keeping things in place. You know, you, you knock the table and things on those flat boards go sliding away. The dual layer boards keep them in place, but on top of that, they give you extra accessibility. Mm -hmm. Players uh, with vision disabilities can feel locations on the player boards, can learn by touch and work through their player boards by touch without yep. having to read the, you know, possibly small print and, and iconography all over the boards. Yeah, and what they're doing here is you're going to have different shapes for different things, right? So a dual layer board that just giant zones that all feel the same is not as effective as a, a dual layer board that it has different shapes for different things that fit into them. Um, uh, just to call out a particular game, the Terraforming Mars ones are not going to really help all that much with accessibility. They're going to help because you'll get to know where the areas are, but compared to something where each of the different resources is a different shape, it's going to be more accessible. So the more you vary the various holes on your dual layer board, the more effective it's going to be for more players. Absolutely. Now, one I've got to call out since we're talking about accessibility is large font sizes, please. Card game designers in particular, I would greatly appreciate it if you would resize your font based on the amount of text you're using. Do not keep the same font at the same size for the whole game because I'm sure you have that one card that's more complicated than all the rest that takes up the entire box, so everything else has to be a smaller size. That makes no sense. Resize your text. If a card only does one simple thing, make it as big as possible so it's nice and clear. Yes, still, shrink your font if you need to because you've got that one complicated card, but please don't keep the same size for no reason. This also applies to rule books. You want a large font, please use white space. Make it easy to read. Um, this goes above and beyond, but they include examples and pictures and all that other stuff. But the whole thing is we have moved well past the point when rule books need to look like technical manuals. Nothing I buy in 2023 should look like Starfleet battles. Now, another thing, if your game is complex and you have a thicker rule book, say more than six pages, Please include an index. 
especially once you get to the 40 plus page mark. I own games that are over 40 pages that do not have an index and I hate them for it. And to be clear, we do mean index, not table of contents. Yes. Table of contents are great too, but at a certain page count, index is what's really needed. Now, something we talked about in our episode about board games that are too pretty is using artwork to sort and differentiate things. Matching board colors to sections of the rulebook for easy lookup, resources that can be spent in a different format than reasons, resources that accumulate, uh, all of the cards for one type of unit in the same color, uh, you know, separate things, make things obvious. Yes. You don't have to just use a tiny little icon up in the corner. Yeah, totally agree on this one. We've seen this. I, I've seen it done great and I've seen it done poorly. Uh, uh, it just use your graphic design to import art useful information above and beyond. It looks cool. I think, I think is the main point here. I uh, listened to our entire episode two episodes ago where we talk about, can a board game be too pretty? We get into this a little bit more detailed. Now I'm going to call out another one from the chat. Thank you. Red me Ryan. If there is not enough room on a standard poker or Euro size playing card, use a larger card. I think you know one game in particular that we've complained about this quite a bit lately. Uh, and I'm going to call them out. That is the My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria game. There is no reason that the Ponyville cards are the same size as the cards that go in my deck, especially in a game that comes with other larger tarot size cards in it. So it's not even like they would need a new die. Please, please use bigger cards if you need to. I get it. If you're shuffling cards, you might want to stick to a standard deck size. That makes sense. Um, I, I, similarly, don't use hobbit size cards if you're going to have a lot of information on the cards. So I haven't seen that come up too often. No, but, and we've got someone else in the chat. First time chatter, Dino Corgi saying, counter argument, stop having paragraphs on cards in the first place. Now, I guess there yes. are certain games where that may or may not be, be possible, but there are <laughs> definitely some games that tend to get a little on the wordy side and could probably use as much an edit of their card text as they put into their yeah. rule books. See, that's a hard one, right? The, a perfect example of that is looking through the history of Magic the Gathering. At one point when I played, I, I, we're going to throw this in there. At one point when I played, the cards didn't explain anything. They just had all kinds of keywords on them. So you would play the card and it would say trample, or you would play the card and say flying, or it would say wall, and that's it. You you would then need to know the rules for what trample meant or what 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 these things meant. But it was simple so, enough at that time that every starter deck came with a little manual inside the box. Yeah, but again, it was like a 60-page manual, so it really wasn't the right answer. <laughs> but play, players got to know them and learn them because there weren't that many of them. Then the next generation came out, and I don't know again when this happened, but all of a sudden, they put all the text for every ability on every card. And I'm like, okay, this is great in a way, but I can now no longer quickly look over at my opponent's, um, I don't even know what you call your player, my opponent's tableau, and be like, oh, okay, I know what that does, I know what that does, I know what that does. Yeah, they made the words bold, but like it wasn't easy to see. And I've noticed as concurrent sets have come out, they have really shifted back and forth and back and forth, where like certain keywords are so complex, it basically says, see the rule book, where other ones are explained. And I've got to say, finding that perfect balance has got to be difficult. Magic's like the most popular card game in the world, at least for hobby gamers, and they still haven't figured out exactly how much text to put on cards. Absolutely, especially the longer the game is out there and the more complexity they feel they need to add uh, with each additional expansion moving on, uh, they're, they're really kind of trapped between uh, too little and too much yeah. uh, because they, they want more gameplay without more confusion. Now, what I got to ask is why didn't Magic come with a single card the size of the rest of the card that was a reference that just listed this, what, eight different special effects at the time? Right. That was just that. That's that quality of life improvement that was missing back when we used to play. And honestly, I don't know. Do they do one now? Is there is there like a player handout that you can have for all the abilities for Magic? Uh, I, I think Magic to me, Magic seems like one of those games where you're supposed to know that stuff. And uh, it's part I, of the part of the gatekeeping uh, of the system. Yeah, I guess. I guess. Um. So we talked a bit about uh, dual air boards, but to, another thing you can step up is everything else right? Uh, deluxe components, deluxified, whatever term you want, board game bling, whatever term you care to use. 
is is can be fantastic quality of life improvements again especially for anyone with a disability these can greatly help with accessibility but even as an able-bodied person i just love having some of these upgrades now i don't want to get into the argument what's better plastic or wood what's better minis or meeples that's a personal choice and i know there's people on both sides of that fence but the important part is have it so those minis or meeples are unique so that things are differentiated by more than just color of a cube you've got metal coins is an upgrade that you think wouldn't matter so much but as an able-bodied person it's just so nice and they clink and they feel awesome but as someone with a disability having a textured coin where you can tell what the nomination is by touch it's fantastic and makes games that are possibly unplayable before now playable you're talking about all the other different things you can do to improve various resources player boards even if you've got six different player colors and have the player boards have different edges that's just something to help differentiate them yeah and along with that varying your cubes if you have three resources don't give me three different colored square cubes yeah just changing the cube color is not enough give them shape oh. give them texture give blind meeples give seeing uh, elderly meeples whoever <laughs> an ability to reach out and differentiate not only by touch but at a glance yeah. you know make it really easy without any confusion as to what is your you know energy level and what is your titanium level now here's one you don't see all that often that i wish were in more games and i don't even think of this until i see it and then i'm like oh more games should do that and that is a separate sheet or sheets showing you how to quickly set up the game at a minimum give me a two-page spread in the rule book right at the start so i know exactly where to look to figure out things like how many cards does everyone start? That is the one that kills me the most. How many cards does everyone start? Every game. At most deck builders is five. Sometimes it's six. Every now and then it's four. Oh, first round, one player only gets three. I'm about to play birds of a feather. Okay, wait, how many players do we have? How many cards do I have to deal out? Please tell me how many cards everyone gets. Tell me what starting resources people get. Show me what goes out in the map. Show me what's, where things are supposed to go on a player's board if you haven't already made that clear by making a dual layer board. Please show me a quick way to get the set up, game set up. As someone who teaches games and someone who brings games to public play events, anything you can do to help me get to the game to the table quicker and get people playing is appreciated. And now I find this especially when there are a lot of different ways to set up depending mm -hmm. on player counts. The number of times I have been st setting up a game only to realize that I have to tear it down and start over again because, oh, I'm only playing with three players, not with four. And that's a custom thing that is only mentioned 18 pages later in the mm -hmm. back of the book. Uh, what, uh, Mar uh, Marvel um, Legends, uh, Mar uh, Legends, uh, that, that, that one, the one, the one behind me there, that one. To play, you, there's a solo Marvel game. Marvel Legendary. Legendary. There's a solo play, but they don't actually give you how to set up the solo play. They only give you how to set up the normal wow. game, and then you have to find a paragraph of text telling you all the different changes that have to be made mm -hmm. to set it up for solo play. And it was infuriating because it didn't explain it well at all. Wow. Uh, and I very nearly gave up and said, I don't really, <laughs> really need to play this game that much. Yeah, uh, I, this is another one that, that's important for the, the do we were talking about double-sided player boards. I've messed that up so often. You know how frustrating it is to set up an entire game of tapestry and have everything up and then realize you got it on the wrong side of the board? Or another one was um, Horizon Zero Dawn. Yep. We didn't figure out until the fourth hunt playing with Tori and Kat that the, the boards are two-sided. Like, we knew they were two-sided. And the problem is they say A2 on both sides. And I thought one side was A and one side was B. So when the encounter cards came out that showed how to lay the boards out, and said, oh, they're all A's. And I'm like, oh, I guess I grabbed them all properly. They're all A's. There we go. What well, ends up A2 has a one to two player side and a three to four player side. And a couple times we had one to two player sides out when we were playing three to four players. So we played extreme. That's a co-op-ish game. So I guess it wasn't that bad. But like if that was clearly explained somewhere, 
I wouldn't have made that mistake. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna label your boards A and B, label the same side. Like two A and B should be opposite sides. There's no yes. reason for numbering them the way they did in that game, in Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game. Those boards are numbered wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's... there's no way <laughs> to justify what they did. It's just wrong. <laughs> there you go. And and include more than one. Also, like we're saying this, but like. Yes, it's great if you give me the standard player setup, kind of like Sean said with, with thing, but include multiple sheets. Heck, two side. If you have a two sided board, give me a two sided how to set up the game sheet. So then I make sure I'm on the right side of that. Uh, so, is this a tapestry? I think is one of the ones that did a really good job of this, except for the fact that I multiple times set up on the wrong side. But it, it was really good for that. But like even just the, the two played spread. Where it just says one do this, two do this, three do this, four do this, with it all graphically showing there. Many games do it. More games should do it, but also pull that out of the rule book. So the next time I go to play, I can just reference that and I don't need to find it in the book. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's no reason to hide information from your players, especially when it's the opening of the game. When, yeah. when this is how you're going to get the game started, get the game played. If you don't want your players to play the game, fine. Don't don't tell them how to start. But <laughs> otherwise, let us know. All right. Now we're getting to uh, to a little more high level and something that, that, I don't know, seems to be like a hot topic for us this year. In the last year, we have mentioned onboarding a whole lot. And I would like to see more onboarding in board games. Now, this can come in all kinds of different forms. There's no perfect way to onboard someone to your game, but things like a quick start guide or a tutorial or an intro mission or a sample starting hand or even Catan did this. Going back to like Y2K, it had a standard board set up that gives you a balanced board that doesn't give anyone an advantage. Having that would be awesome. Now, this is tricky because I've seen awesome ones that do it right where you get your quick start guide and it leads you through your first game or your first two turns or your first year. And I've seen terrible ones where basically it says, all right, set this up as said in the main rule book. And then you have to go to the main rule book and read it. Then you go back and go, okay, then you're going to start playing this adventure. But when you open the door, check out this section of the main rule book and you're flipping back and forth. Um, I'm sure everyone listening probably is thinking of a specific game right now, but I've seen this enough different places. You all could be thinking of different games. There's other ways to do this too, like just simpler rules for the first play. Leave this in the box. Enemies don't act for the first two turns. Ignore the event phase. What I'd love to see is like a short campaign that slowly introduces rules. Now that one's hard to pull off. Yeah, that that's that's tough. But again, that goes back to our episode about uh, what board games can learn from video games. You know, yes. slowly working people into it. If you've got a complex game, don't start people off cold with all the rules and all the abilities. Give them a couple of turns adding new things or a couple of rounds adding new things and teach people how to play. Uh, and then once you've done, you can put that, you know, slide that book into the bottom of the box underneath all your inserts yeah. or what have you. And you don't need to uh, have it again, but not having it makes a big difference. No, it's true. And I've seen some great ones like, like Race for the Galaxy. I, I know Deanna's not a fan of this teaching method, but as you play through a starting hand, there are numbered cards and you give the cards to players and you go, okay, you play this card. Okay, you play that card. Okay, you play that card. Okay, you play that card. And now we're going to run this phase and see how it affects everyone. Now you guys finish playing. And and I admit it's 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 kind of annoying and it feels very hand-holdy. And as a, as a gamer, you kind of want to say, ah, I'm an experienced gamer. I know what I'm doing. But you know how many people I hear complain about the iconography and Race for the Galaxy and confusion over the turn order who've never played this? So of course there is, because the game gave you a tool to learn this stuff and you threw it out thinking you were too smart. Use this stuff if it is provided. Yeah, and our, our perfect example that we've, we've talked about in the past and I think learned from the video games the way they should is Sorcerer's Arena. Source Arena started off as a mobile yeah. game. And like most mobile games, when you first start the game, you haven't unlocked all the different things you can do and all the different zones you mm -hmm. can play in. You just have a few characters and you go and you, you sling spells at somebody else. Well, the board game does the same thing. Your first game, you have two characters and they don't have any fancy abilities. You're just moving around and learning the board. And then you play the next mm -hmm. chapter and the next chapter. And then by the fourth chapter, it's here you go. Here's all the rules. 
yeah. have at it. And it's a fantastic way to onboard someone into this game. And yeah, sure, it it took an extra four, maybe six pages of the rule book. Mm-hmm. Is that really that hard? Yeah. And I know a lot of gamers and even the designer is like, hey, here's the the full rules right from the start for you hobby gamers, because hobby gamers ask for it. I might bite the bullet. I'm a hobby gamer. I have thousands of games. I'm surrounded by them. I played all of well, all but six percent of everything down here. And and I I learned I didn't actually learn anything, but like it worked. It didn't take that long, especially the first game where you only played at 10 points. Next game's only to 15. Like I managed to get to the fourth chapter in one night of playing. It's not like it took that long. Absolutely. Try not to attack every gamer's ego out there, but sometimes, <laughs> you know, be humble. Like if they provide the onboarding, use it. It, it mainly be the, the one that bugs me is the race for the galaxy one. Cause I, I hear people, Oh, that game is too hard. I'm like, well, did you go through the tutorial in the book? Huh? No. And I'm like, well, it, it's there for a reason. Yeah. And I think really, you know, instructions, rule books and other paper or digital aspects of teaching and referencing the game. We've talked about a mm-hmm. whole bunch of different, you know, different things you can use. They really are some of the easiest and most important aspects that any publisher can take some extra time on for yeah. a lot less cost than many other component editions. You're not, you know, chipping in for metal coins or buying the latest game trays, custom molds. Um, you know, when we've been discussing uh, in this in our Discord, the first thing that came up for most people uh, when when we talked about this in our Discord was rule books, references, index, references, extra yeah. cards, you know, ways of get, keeping that information fresh. It's a sore point mm-hmm. with many gamers, and it's something that I think that a lot of publishers could really learn from. Yeah, if you're going to spend five years developing your game, don't spend five days writing your rule book, right? <laughs> like, we we see this a lot with uh with Kickstarters and indie designers and 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 things and sean's got more of a a burr about this than i do but i I spend time on your rule book your rule book is how you're imparting your knowledge of how to play the game to the players do like should do the best job you possibly can on that that's one of the most important parts of your game uh how many times we open up a game and immediately there's already an faq there's already a rule summary i'm like how did you miss this stuff and this is going to come up tonight during our review. So it's it's a common problem. And it just, I just, I think people are like, my game's done. Let's go. Let's get it out. Oh, yeah, the rules. Yeah, this is how you play. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, blind playtesting is still either not done or not understood when it is done far too often. Now, here's one uh, from Deanna, my wife, that I hadn't thought of. She brought up because I was sitting in the in the in the in our office working on this. And I'm like, hey, what are quality of life improvements you'd like to see? And we overlapped on a lot. But she called out one that I hadn't thought of. And that is include something to indicate what color, what faction, what team each player is playing. So you can quickly look over and see who owns what. Now, one of the reasons for this is you want to be able to do that without giving in the way that you're looking because and she likes the heavier strategy games, right? So you don't want to have to say, oh, what color are you again? Because as soon as you ask that, you have a tell saying, oh, you're now looking at where my pieces are on the board. Now, in some games, this is totally redundant, especially if you have a whole bunch of playing pieces of that color in front of you or if you're playing a game where everyone's got their own deck of cards or whatever. But in other games... It's just, it, 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 we find we're missing them. There was something we were playing the other day and I was like, what? wait a minute, there's nothing here to indicate what color you're playing. And I can't remember which game it was. I think it might've been the, stat, the, the ladder climbing, which I'm totally drawing a blank on, Japanese game about going to the temples and first and last place lose. And you it's whoever's Kimono? in the... No, no, that's, oh, no, that's uh, the Samurai uh, Battle uh, one. Right. I, I'm totally drawing a blank. On it it might've been that, where we kept forgetting like who was who, who was in what spot. Now, when you're, when you're, no, not Kaido. That's not it either. It begins with an S, I think. If I, if I go look around, I could probably find it. But yeah, I, yeah. Uh, there it is. Shikoku. There we go. Found it. Shikoku. Um, so now, depends who you play with on this. Now, our home group, everyone knows I'm playing yellow. Uh, D is playing green. Jen is playing blue. Gwen's playing whatever's left over. Right. So I'm playing with my family and my kids. We don't tend to make this mistake. But man, I go to the barbershop bar and I play a game. 
especially if someone else takes yellow, I'm lost. I have no idea who's who. I will move the yellow player's piece at some point during the game because I always play yellow. But I, just something, something quick and simple that indicates what color everyone's playing or faction, whatever. It doesn't have to be color. Now, another one, and this is a little one, and I think this is, is, is less important these days than it used to be, but every once in a while it still slips in, is some form of score tracking. I shouldn't need to grab a piece of paper and a pencil to score my game in 2023. Uh, looking at you, Quirkle. This could be a pad of score sheets, uh, a dry erase board, or even an app you can download, which is, we've got a great example of this coming up in a review later tonight. But something that breaks things down so you don't have to look at your score, trying to figure out all the different pieces or, or, or you know, th there's a lot of different ways to score and, and different, you know, depending on the game, this could be more complex or, or easier. Uh, but, you know, something simple like what they had on the... Uh, Valeria, Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, where you've got, you know, five different things that you're scoring or six different things you're scoring. You put a number in each one. There's enough space that if you want to track as you're going along, mm -hmm. you can do tick marks or write numbers, whatever works for you. Uh, it just makes it easier for everyone at the end of the game. And honestly, having these two helps during the game. Having a score sheet is a way to point out to players, how do you win this game? especially when you're getting into Euros, Stefan Feld style point salads. It's really easy to forget some of the different scoring opportunities, as well as completely forgetting what the game is about because you're lost in doing the actions. Um, you're playing your game and you're moving all your units on your map and you've collected a ton of gold and you have all these resources. And then you get to the end of the game and lose because it's actually all about the zones you control on the map. And you would get that if you look at the score sheet when zone control is worth this much, extra resources are a tiebreaker. Oh, okay, I guess I shouldn't have held on to so many resources. Yeah, and that's that's a real problem. I will say my, myself, I have on more than one occasion uh, gone after the wrong thing because it's not obviously clear. You know, yeah, you want a lot of good coin, well, except coin doesn't actually score anything in this game. Yeah. It's just about buying the resources you actually need. And another, another thing here is is this is a side note. All right, side note, a tabletop bellhop. I don't we can we need a term for side notes. Tabletop bellhop side note. Pay attention to what that tiebreaker is. This is a game design tip. By making something the tiebreaker, you make it more important than every other resource in the game, except for whatever scores you the points. So just a heads up, if you're making the game, you're like most apples at the end of the game is the tiebreaker, that now makes apples more important than bananas. So just just a heads up to watch for that. And as a player, be aware of this. If there's something that is a tiebreaker and you've got a turn that's kind of middling where you're not advancing a lot in points, well, collect a bit of that tiebreaker, whatever it is, just in case. All right. Next one I would like to see more of is backstory, fiction, artwork. Throw me some theme. I love it when a thematic game goes all in on its theme. Now, I'm not talking about necessarily, like, don't overdo it. We Again, two episodes ago, we talked about going too far with this. Make this separate from the game. Uh, mainly, you see those license games where you'll pick up a game and there'll be a lore book with it. Horizon Zero Dawn came with a, a whole book about the world of Horizon Zero Dawn. I, but other games do it well, just as well. It doesn't have to be licensed. Now, a really weird one that I own that I find fascinating that does a bit of this is Space Base. There are bits in this book about the various ships and the factions, and this ship is used to explore this part of space where they found the blah, blah, blah nebula. That matters not at all while playing Space Base. Space Base is, is a fairly abstract game. It's a role for resource game where you're an engine builder. No combos in that. I guess there's combos in that one. Sorry to go back to an earlier topic on engine builders. It's an engine builder either way. None of this matters. But you can tell someone at AEG All Direct Entertainment Group as a whole world made for space base and loves interjecting these little parts. Like I want to play the game with that one. So every time they like launch a ship, they tell me it's mission it's on. <laughs> I love seeing little extra bits like that. Like, like just the thematic, like includes some, some backstory, some extra artwork, some, I, I games, some games have soundtracks, uh, Venturia. One of the things I liked about playing Adventuria on tabletop simulators, it had an Adventuria soundtrack and I'm like, Oh, it's just cool. You put on background music. While you're playing the game to kind of increase the immersion. I love that kind of stuff. 
Now, you can argue that this also could go the other way. And again, this goes back to the things we have talked about recently. Uh, it could be at some point able to get in the way of the rules yeah. and the other important bits that you actually need to get the game to the table. So do find that balance uh, between, you know, having the interesting immersion, but still make sure that you can get the game to the table and you're not tripping over, you know, what the Gamma Quadrant sh exploration ship does when you really right. just want to know how many cards do I start with? Yeah, true. There is definitely a fine line there. Uh, Darkling Blight in the chat room is calling out Thunderstone Quest goes so heavy on the story and lore that doesn't translate into gameplay all that well when you're actually playing. So like, like to me, this is more like the extra, like don't it, not putting too much story in the game, but like giving me some extra background and text, like as opposed to trying to throw in too much in the game. So I, I, there's a balance there. What I, what I was calling out is the quality of life is like, I have Eclipse second on for the galaxy and there's an art book. Like it, it, I don't need the art book when I'm playing. I don't reference the art book when I'm playing. But you know what? When I got some downtime and I'm going to the coffee shop, I can bring that and flip through it and go, ah, this is some cool stuff here. And then next time I play the game, I might appreciate some of the stuff in the game more. So I'll be like, oh, that's the faction that did this thing. All right, one of the ones I'm sure people knew we were going to bring up here, and, and and Sean should probably be the one talking about this more than me because I think he's bought more of them. And that is a big box when a game grows so that it can no longer hold all of its contents due to multiple expansions. Now, personally, I like it way better when this is part of a bigger expansion that also gives you new stuff and not just the box um, to the best one I have ever played or best example of this still to me is the Galactic Orders expansion for Core Worlds. Core Worlds comes in a fairly small box that holds everything you need to play in it. Well, the first expansion actually came in a bigger box than the base game. And some people complained about this and they're like, why is the expansion bigger than the base game? And I'm like, yeah, but now it all fits in the expansion box. And then some people complain that they want it. They want it to say core worlds, not galactic orders. And I'm like, whatever, you're being silly. This is brilliant because now I can fit my base game and that expansion. And they even planned ahead because it fits the next expansion as well onto one box. And I got a whole expansion at the same time because I got to say Galactic Orders is fantastic. And if you play Core Worlds, you haven't played Core Worlds until you use Galactic Orders. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's just all around great. And I got to say, I love being able to keep all of my games. If I, in an ideal world, every game I owned would be one box to have everything I need to play in one spot, including expansion content. Like I go far enough to buy box inserts for games where the publishers haven't provided a big box I'll try to find some solution that uses the existing box to, to do it. A, a great example of this, and I'm still shocked it works, is Battlestar Galactica, the game, has three expansions with one box insert. All four boxes is combined into one, and it works. I, I love that. I'm like, oh, my Battlestar Galactica no, no longer takes up 25% of a shelf. This is great. Yeah. And now, not only adding new content, but better ways to use the content that you've collected that has required this new box. So shout yeah. out to Cryptozoic for the randomizer systems that come with the multiverse box. So you don't necessarily even have to decide what you're, what parts you're gonna be playing with. They've put in, uh, as well as having a multiverse expansion that comes with the game, they built an entire randomizer system so that you can help figure out what parts of the, uh, yeah. the DC deck building you want to use. Next up to go with the big box, I want a big book. I like big books and I cannot lie. I want a universal rule book after your game has multiple expansions. One of the things that's driving me bonkers right now with Disney Sorcerer's Arena is when a character uses a status effect and I got to remember which, uh, okay, what character was that? Okay, which expansion? Okay, now I got to find that book because my, my game is now a multi-chapter big book and four little tiny books to figure out exactly what no punchbacks does. I give me all of the info in one place. Now, a great example of this is the Pathfinder Adventure card game core set, which sounds like it's the first part of a product, but it was actually a relaunch of a game line where they took everything from all the different expansions that had ever been published and put it in one thick book. Now, I admit that thick book is intimidating and kind of reads like a technical manual, but it saves you having to look up anything. It's all in one place. Another example that did it a little different, because what that did is you just read the rule book, start to finish. 
and it just makes sense. You have a, it, you wouldn't know there were expansions in there. Now, Castle Panic Big Box did something a little different. What it did is it just included all the rules for the different things in order they were released. So in one book, you've got the Castle Panic rules, you've got uh, the Wizard's Tower rules, the Dark Titan rules, and so on. And they're they're in there. Uh, personally, I would have liked they were color-coded a little better so you could jump to the different sections. But I do dig the fact that, again, I have one book. I don't have to look around for the different books. Another one is the Anachrony Infinity Box, which, again, put out a nice, thick, solid rule book that taught you everything. And interestingly, what they did is they pulled the expansion content into a separate book. So here's the core rules for the game, but here's all the expansion content. And that game has a lot. It has a lot of these little modules where you're like, I'm just going to add in a disrupted timeline. Oh, I'm just going to add in an end of the world track. Oh, I'm just going to add in a new faction. All of those are in a separate book. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely a lot of games that do it right. Unfortunately, there are still a number of games that do it wrong. But now let's look at our top six existing quality of life improvements. Uh, why don't we do three from each of us? All right. We're going to wrap up with this. So just a heads up to the chat. If you have anything else you want to share, we'll be looking for your comments next. So for me, this is an easy and kind of obvious one, and that is the new multiverse box, not the one up here, not, not this one, that's the old one, the new multiverse box from Cryptozoic for the DC deck building game. They really vastly improved it over the original with more ways to hold the various sized cards, which was the biggest problem in the mm -hmm. original one, where they had multi multiple sizes of cards, but only one size of receptacle uh they've added deck boxes for all the different components that have come out nice. and all the things and they've actually lowered part of the insert that's built into the box to accommodate rule books and things in one section so while they haven't come out with a giant rule book which would be nice they have given you space to store all of your rule books now is this the one you backed or the one that's coming out that is the next one no this is the one i backed so this uh, is the one you backed yeah. okay so one of the things I remember you complained about this is the way they had put the sticker on the box for the artwork that stuff was getting caught. Is that, uh, that this was one the, or the last one? That was the, ori that was that the, was the original one. Is yeah. that fixed? Yep. They've, 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 they've really gone over and above. They've, they've listened to, listened to people or, or looked at it themselves perhaps and, and <laughs> figured out, Oh wait, we didn't do this quite right. Yeah. The fold over on the, uh, on the, on the, 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 the original box cards would catch in it. Yep. So I'm going to call out one we didn't mention, though we kind of talked about organizing components, but tuck boxes. I talked about bowls and trays and game trays and stuff. Tuck boxes are awesome. Um, most recently, Fighting Fantasy Adventures used those to sort out the different decks. It was just a prototype and they used tuck boxes. I need to make more tuck boxes. It just it takes time. Like at Board Game Geek, you can pretty much find tuck boxes for everything. I would love to make tuck boxes for, say, Adventuria. But to go with that, our other card holding boxes are a nice upgrade. Like if you give me some way to sort my cards out of the baggies as a bonus. And the other one I'm going to call out, which I know was in Sean's multiverse box is dividers. If you were going to give me a deck building game or anything else where I'm only going to use part of the game at once, give me dividers to sort the cards, please. And, and to be fair and listen, folks, those plastic inserts where you build the divider physically in to separate them, they don't really yeah. work that well. It, you're way easier just getting an actual physical like bookmark that you can slide in there and save yourself the molding space. For props on a good one, except it only works when you own the big box, the um, Disney Smash Up had like nice thick card ones that were also a reference on what that dick did and how hard it was to play, which I thought was really cool. All right, my first one, I've already mentioned at least once or twice tonight, <laughs> is the infinity box for anachrony and honestly this whole product yes there's a new new way to play and there's an expansion in there but really it's just a bunch of quality of life improvements thrown together one a giant box you can see it behind my head anyone who's watching this on video to hold everything in one place including every single expansion and as i mentioned there's a lot but not only hold the expansions there are game trays inserts that sort everything. So every expansion has its own tray. So you literally, if you're like, I want to play with the Shattered World expansion, you have a tray for that. That is amazing. There is also individual player trays. 
there's a thing that shows you what goes where and how to stack it all. Yes, it's a book because there's that many different trays in this game, but it's all there. Component in upgrades that replace a lot of the cardboard components with plastic tokens and a lot of the plastic resources with metal. A combined rule book and a lore and art book and so much more. It's like half the stuff we mentioned tonight is included in that box. That is one of the most impressive. You know, you guys love this game. You folk love this game. We're going to give you a new expansion, but we're also just going to add everything you've ever asked for. Here you go. And that's what that felt like to me. So my next one is is sort of silly and simple, but at the same point, it actually made a big difference. So when playing Azul, the original Azul, a big problem, depending on where you were playing and, and, and where you what kind of uh, game uh, gaming experience you were having is knocking that player board and shifting your mo- shifting your uh, your your pieces around and things sliding well the crystal mosaic expansion solved that by giving you a crystal mosaic the plastic molded uh dual not dual layer but molded player board so that when you put a tile down it stayed there uh and and while it's not a huge thing it's enough to make a really nice quality of life upgrade for this game for me, it's not the tiles. It was the scoring piece, the little mm. tiny scoring <laughs> yes. cube. That was the big one. Tile shift, you usually know where they went, where you put them, or they're grouped together, right? But the score token, how many times I played as a in my score token, I'm playing, I'm playing, I look, and it's like in the middle of four numbers. And I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> Did I have 25 I, Did anyone remember what I was at? <laughs> Does anyone remember what I was at? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Crystal Mosaic was actually, that was a great expansion, actually, because it also came with two new boards that changed up the gameplay more than I thought they would. All right, the next one I'm going to call out, and this is a quality of life improvement that a lot of board gamers have made to their games, not necessarily provided by the publisher, and that is switching to using poker chips instead of paper money or coins or whatever the game comes with. I Or even for scoring. I've even seen people that use poker chips just to track your score in high-scoring games. Well, I'm going to call it a specific set and those are the Iron Clays. Now, these were made by Roxley Games, and they were originally included in the Kickstarter Deluxe Editions of Brass, Lancashire, and Birmingham. Now they sell these completely separately. You can just go on Roxley's website and buy your Iron Clays. These are fantastic gamer-quality poker chips that just feel good in your hand. They've got the, the weight to them. Yes, they're great for playing brass because they happen to be also the exact same size that you stack your money you spend every turn. But they're also great for any game where you want to replace cardboard, paper money, or like I said, even just for scoring in a game where scoring is obvious. So people can look across the table to see what your score is at. And they just feel so nice. They do. They (laughs) They really do. They really do. So next one I'm going to bring up is Birds of a Feather Western North America, which is a game we're going to be reviewing a little later. And this is because they put out an app that not only allows you to play the game solo as you're sitting around bored, but it's a digital scorekeeping app, which takes Mm -hmm. all the hassle out of scoring. Now, they have a double sided score pad that's environmentally friendly. Uh, Now, we all we complain about the non double sided score pads, but they've they've gone and they've given you double sided ones. But. If you've got a phone, if everyone or everyone at the table has a phone, it is so much easier to score this game by using yeah. the the freely provided app on your app store of choice. And it's even available on Steam if, you, if you'd like uh, to score that game. It just makes it easy, uses less resources, and makes for a smoother yeah. gaming experience for what's already a pretty easy game, but just makes it that much easier. Also provides background music, but uh, if you're anything like me, you, you you won't leave that on long. <laughs> and turn off the, the voiceover. That was the, yeah. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. Somehow I had voiceover at the beginning. It's very accessible, which is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I am I, I am going to do, uh, what did Roger suggested, board game dispatch uh, or tabletop bellhop uh, dispatch as, as a <laughs> side note. Side note, pro tip. When filling out a, a scorecard like this where you are just checking off things this came right from the birds of the feather um rule book and i thought it was brilliant this game is all about being environmentally friendly and points out how to use each score sheet three times before you're done with it the first time you put a slash the next time you put a slash the other direction making an x the third time you fill the circle in 
you just tripled your amount of sheets, which I thought was kind of brilliant. All right, my next game, last game, yeah, this is my third, is um, not a game, but an improvement for a game, and that is the Terraforming Mars Dual Layer Boards, not the one Stronghold put out, but the ones Deanna got me from Etsy, which I think I might have finally removed from my game, because I was going to I was gonna hold one up, but I couldn't find it in the box, but I, I was kind of rushing before the show started. Yes, yeah, Stronghold finally put out official two-layer boards, and yeah, they're pretty good. But I'm always going to have a soft spot for the wooden boards Deanna got me. They only cover up the number tracking part of the boards in the middle. So they're nice and small. They were unobtrusive. They worked great. And they didn't have the kind of staggered slot thing for the individual cubes, which is what Stonemeyer or Stonemeyer is the wrong name. Stronghold did for the current board. And I find it's still pretty easy to bump my, my numbers by one spot left or right because of the staggered thing. I, I find those annoying on the new boards. I love the one she found me on Etsy. Um, I, if they're still, if the shop's still around, I'll be sure to put a link in the show notes. I uh, know we are an Etsy affiliate, so it'll be affiliate link, but whatever. These are awesome. I like these were honestly, in my opinion, better than the official version. All right. Well, there we have a significant number of quality of life improvements that we'd love to see more of in modern hobby board games. What's something that a publisher can do that doesn't actually impact the gameplay of a game, but that you would appreciate having that would make you want to play that game more? I have a question for us. Hit us up with an email, questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or go over to the blog and click on Ask the Bellhop. Join us for a look at At the Ready the latest expansion for Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances that was just released this past weekend at Gen Con. Thanks to the op for getting us an early review copy of this expansion back at Origins. So Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances and the At The Ready expansion for it were all designed by Sean Fletcher, sometimes known as Fletch. And as Sean just said, they were published by the op, uh, sometimes known as USAopoly. This is the fourth expansion for Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances. Now, while this expansion is fully integrable and compatible with the previous expansions, you will need a copy of the base game, base core game set in order to use these new characters. Now, in the case of this expansion, those new characters happen to be Mrs. Potts from Beauty and the Beast, Robin Hood, and Mulan from, well, Robin Hood and Mulan. Now, as you can see in our At The Ready unboxing video on YouTube, what you get matches what came in the previous expansions. Standees, 10 card decks for each of the characters, some extra status tokens, and a short rule book. Now the only new rule presented here is the same one that's been in every expansion release so far, and that is the rules for constant abilities, which were originally introduced in Turning the Tide. There's no new status effects or any funky stuff like new terrain tiles or token characters. Well, let's get to each of the new characters and what they bring to the game. Right, I'm going to start off with Mrs. Potts. I would call her a support character. She has a basic move of two, provides two cards to your hand, but only a basic attack of one, and fairly low health at seven. Now, her deck is a real mixed bag, with most cards depending on what her allies are doing, with multiple cards giving a reward for her being next to an ally on a crown space. She also has a number of cards that let you draw cards from your deck, so while playing with her on your team, you don't tend to get that thing where way halfway through the game, you're down to a hand of only two or three cards to work with. Now, to go with that, she has a skill you're going to want to use every turn. This lets her draw a card from the top of the deck and then place a card from your hand, either on top of the deck or the bottom. So something from your hand. It could be the one you just drew. Now, speaking of drawing cards, she also has a pretty cool constant ability that anytime anyone from your team draws a card and it's a POTS card, that character gets to move one square. No, not even necessarily on Potts' turn. Or if your opponent makes you draw a card. Now, finally, a number of her cards have abilities that go off when they're discarded. These cards make perfect move and attack boost cards to use on other characters' turns and combo well with anyone who causes you to discard cards to make their abilities go off. Well, next we have Robin Hood, who, as you would expect, has a number of ranged attack cards. Even his skill lets you turn any attack into a range 2 attack if you discard an attack card. Robin is also very good at hiding and can often spend most of the battle with the stealth status effect on him. 
Now, while some of this comes from his cards, the main place you will get stealth from is the constant ability that grants him one stealth whenever you gain exactly one crown. Then we get to the most thematic part of this character. Robin is all about stealing from the rich to help the poor, and this is respectfully reflected on almost every card in his deck, which has some form of additional effect if played when your opponent has more crowns than you. Now, stat-wise, Robin gives you two cards, has the standard two move to attack, which can be raided into that range two attack with his skill, and a chunky nine health, which, when combined with stealth, makes him really hard to take out. Now, that leaves us with Mulan, who plays like a frontline support character. She has standard attack and defense, but nine health and a large number of high damage attack cards. She also has her abilities that give her either tough or strong conditions that back up that frontline role. This is reinforced by her level up ability, which gives her a number of uh, tough tokens that she can spend to defend allies next to her. Now, as a support character, she can heal almost dead characters with a skill, giving two hit points to anyone with two or fewer hit points to start with. And she can also pass off strong to other princess characters. She also has one of the most powerful skills in the game, letting her do two automatic damage to an adjacent rival, but only if that rival is next to two non-token allies. This is huge, but hard to pull off. But when you can combine that with one of her powerful attack cards, you can take out many of the characters in the game in one turn. Now, another ability that I haven't really gotten to use to good effect yet, but seems powerful, are some cards that do damage and remove status effects from the target. I think these could be great against the right opponents, but they never really worked well in the games I played because removing invulnerable, tough, or no punchbacks after you hit just isn't the best use of those cards. Well, now that we have some idea of what these characters can do, who was your favorite? I I actually really enjoyed Mrs. Potts, which is a character out of all the ones that have been reused for the game. I probably care the least about least about it as far as Disney lore film wise. Like, come on, it's the teapot from from uh, I don't care. But I love the way she works during the game. She's a fantastic support character that includes some never before seen deck management abilities. I adore the way you can get rewarded for discarding her cards from your hand. After all, Mrs. Potts is all about serving others. It's also nice to play Sorcerer's Arena with lots of cards in your hand from the beginning to the end of the game. It's so nice to have more options in the late game. Yeah, I really agree, because I messed up the first time we used this expansion, and I just plain played her wrong. I misunderstood the discard power and was expecting her to need to discard not any time a discard happened, uh, and this really undersold her to me, so I didn't see her true potential until I had her used correctly against me. Yeah. So what was your favorite? uh, Now, Robin Hood, I got a feel for right away. The only problem I had with him was spending too much time thinking about who he would combo well with in later games instead of focusing (laughs) on the game I was playing. He's just a fantastic ranged character, but with the Steal from the Rich ability, you don't need to worry about staying in the lead all the time as you can plan for some nice, powerful combos if you get behind by a couple of crowns. I also really dug Robin, uh, honestly and always. He's a fun character to play, and man, does he annoy your opponents when you keep getting rewarded for him, for them winning all the time. And people hate having their crowns stolen from them. Every time I've done someone to, people are like, mine, no. (laughs) Yeah, that might actually be the biggest change people have to adapt to with this expansion is now knowing that your collected crowns aren't safe anymore. Yeah, I think there was one other card for one character in previous sets that also stole it, but that was one where Robin has a number of them. Now that leaves us with Mulan. I feel kind of bad, like we're, we're leaving her in the dust here. She seems okay, but just not, nothing really stuck out. She just didn't seem that great a character. Now, I think on the right team, she could be fantastic, but just her abilities just didn't excite me. Now, I got to say, looking at the game, I play this game for fun. I play casually. I'm into neat card combos and doing neat things. Maybe for organized play, Mulan's like the best character they ever released. It's like you'll never get better DPS than you will with Mulan. But she just wasn't as fun to play as some of the other characters in the game. 
Now, what I am curious about, though, is her ability triggering on the princess tag. There haven't been a lot of those yet, and it makes me want to try her in an all-princess team. Maybe I'd have more fun playing her with a bunch of other princesses. Yeah, so I agree that while I don't think we found her perfect team yet, the princess yeah. potential is there, and it may just take a more regular player or the next expansion to really have her shine to her full power. Now, overall, this is another solid set of characters for Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliance. This is a game we're still enjoying. We're still playing it pretty regularly. I love getting to try out new characters and seeing how this game has evolved over time. Yeah, this set of characters really had me thinking more about teams and combining of characters, as the cast list has now grown to a point with this fourth expansion where there's something for almost any playstyle available. Now, well, well, part of me wishes this expansion included something new for the game, like a new character token. Like, wouldn't Chip be a perfect character to, to put with Mrs. Potts? Or the Merry Men for Robin? Where's Little John? Or perhaps terrain tiles. Come on, Sherwood Forest tiles would have fit in great. I do appreciate, though, that they didn't do this, that there's nothing new to learn here. There isn't even a new skill. It's all the existing skills from the base game. This makes this a great first expansion for new players or for players who have not been keeping up as all the releases came out. Now, for me, I wasn't expecting any new features, knowing the characters from the digital version. But I can certainly see how not knowing the digital, this box could be a tiny bit of a letdown with just the three characters and nothing new and fancy added on. Now, based on what I've seen online from reactions to posts from the op and our own content we put out after Origins, people seem to be extremely hyped about getting Robin. And I can easily see this being the first Sorcerer's Arena expansion that many people pick up. And I think it's a solid one. And I think they should be excited. I expect for many, he's the reason to buy this. And the other two characters are just a happy bonus. Fair enough. Not really a lot more to say here. Uh, if you dig Sorcerer's Arena, pick it up. If you don't, this isn't going to change things in any significant way that might make someone who didn't enjoy the originals suddenly like it. So skip it. Especially if you're looking for the range and flexibility Robin gives you, or the deck management from Mrs. Potts. If you're a Mulan lover and know how to maximize her potential, we'd love to hear your strategies. Yeah, I'm sure Sean's sitting here listening to this Fletch and going, no, come on, you missed the brilliance of Mrs. Uh, sorry, not Mrs. Pot of Mulan. I'm sure it's there. Just haven't figured it out myself. Maybe she'll pair great with Davy Jones, the other character I just haven't quite grokked yet. At this point, I just took all this stuff, mixed it in with everything else, and all my characters are there. And if you ever sit down with me to play Disney Sorcerer's Arena, you now have 20 different characters to choose from, which is quite impressive. I can't wait to see what comes next. Now, speaking of Fletch, if you are listening, I want to see more stuff that modifies the arena in some ways. That is what I think is the next step for this game. New characters are cool, but I want to see new terrain tiles, some new character tokens, or something totally new. I feel that arena needs something for it. Add in some environmental effects, something that maybe is determined by a random card draw at the beginning of the game and affects both teams. Wouldn't that be cool? All right, well, that's it for our review of the Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances at the Ready Expansion. Have you been playing this Disney and Pixar-themed skirmish game? What's the best team you've come up with so far? Let us know in the comments, and maybe we'll try them out against each other. Hey, if we get to, maybe we'll even live stream it. You can find out a lot more about Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances and its long name and its expansions over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Thank you for joining us for a look at Birds of a Feather, Western North America, a rather thematic card game that we brought home from Origins thanks to Snowbright Studio. The so Birds of a Feather Western North America is an actually an update, a re-release of a previous game, Birds of a Feather, which was published in 2015 by Nothing Sacred Games. Now, this new version is by the same designer, Teal Fristo, and features artwork by Trevor Fristo and Quill Colat. It is being published, as Sean just mentioned, by Snowbright Studios. Improvements in the new game include new graphic design and improved rules for two- and three-player games to reduce the amount of luck at low-player counts and make the game more strategic. 
Now, speaking of player count, this card game plays an impressive one to seven players with games taking under half an hour at all player counts. It's listed as age eight plus, but I think even younger kids could play this if maybe not play it well. So in Birds of a Feather, Western North America, the players are birders traveling to different habitats, attempting to see the most diverse amount of birds possible. The game features five different habitats and seven different birds that can be seen at each, some more rare than others. Each round, players are going to pick a card from their hand to go spot, then everyone reveals their card and everyone checks off every card in play that's at the same habitat they just visited. The birds just played linger for one round, giving other players a chance to visit those habitats and see those birds. After players are down to one card, everyone tallies up their points and the winner is determined. For a look at the fantastic looking bird cards in this game, along with the other components, check out our Birds of a Feather unboxing video on YouTube. Now, one cool thing you will see there, this is a very environmentally friendly game. Not only are all the components made from recycled materials, you also won't find any plastic, except for some stickers sealing the box for shipping retail that couldn't be re re avoided. No shrink wrap on the cards or on the box. In addition, part of the proceeds from each game sold is donated to Journey North, which is a science program about migration patterns. Game component-wise, this small box contains a pack of 60 cards, a thick pack of double-sided scorecards, and a well-laid-out rulebook. This is nestled into a functional cardboard insert. Now, there's also a piece of promotional material inside for Tea Time Adventures. This is a tabletop role-playing game from the same publisher, which on the back includes a full apple turnover recipe, making this only the second game I've ever played that includes a recipe. As for the rulebook, it's pretty good, but I do suggest you read through it twice if playing with less than four players, as there is a rule about drawing additional cards from the deck each round we missed on our first few plays with three. Now, one tool you won't find in the box, but which can be very useful, is the free Birds of a Feather Western North America app, which is available on Steam, iOS, and Android. It gives you a way to play solo that works rather well, as well as providing a scoring app that works really well doing the math for you and saving the sheets in the box. Now, one thing that's almost better on the app when playing solo is that when you play a bird card there, it actually gives you a whole bunch of information on the card about that bird. I thought it was really cool, but I also have to give them props for not including all that on the actual cards in your hands because that would just make them messier and harder to read. Now, while the quick summary you gave earlier pretty much sums it up, yeah. how about we now go over how to play Birds of a Feather in a bit more detail? All right, getting started here is simple. Deal everyone a hand of cards based on the number of players, which in most cases means the entire deck. Give everyone a score sheet or have them open up the app and you're good to go. Each round, players pick one card to play and place it face down on the table. After everyone has placed their card, you flip them over and see where everyone went. These are called the arriving birds. Now at this point, grab your score tracker and tick off all the birds you can see. Those are the ones that are the arriving birds that just got played that match your habitat on the card you just played, as well as any cards on the table that are left there from the last round. Next, you clear away the previous lingering birds, and that round's, round's arriving birds are pushed to the center of the table to become a new set of lingering birds. Like That's pretty much it for the basic rules. Play birds, check what you spotted, remove the lingering birds, the new birds linger from a round. Now, to keep things interesting, each habitat includes one raptor card. When a raptor card is revealed, it scares away any lingering birds in its habitat, preventing anyone from spotting those birds that round. Play continues until everyone has one card left in their hand, and then everyone adds up their score. Every bird you spot is worth one point, except for eggs, which are worth none, and the ace bird, for which each habitat is worth two. You get three bonus points for spotting all of the birds in a habitat. The player with the most points wins, ties go to the player who competed the most sets, and further ties are determined by the most rare bird spotted. Now there is one small twist to these rules when playing with two or three players. With these low player counts when revealing birds, you also flip over one or two cards from the deck, so there were always at least four arriving birds each round. In addition, the rulebook also includes variants to make the game more strategic and less random. First is the migra migration variant, where players pass a number of bird cards to their left before the first round of play. 
Next are the modified two and three player rules, which are the new thing in this printing of the game besides the artwork. These have players draft their hands at the start of the game, as well as making a draw deck at the same time. With two players, each player is going to have their own draw deck, whereas with three players, together you'll create a draw deck. Finally, there are rules for solo play, which has you picking a card to play, drawing three cards from the deck for the other arriving birds. Everything else stays the same, except at the end of each round, you discard a card and draw a new one from the deck. There's also a chart where you get a rank based on your total score. Now, trust me, that makes this game sound way more complicated than it really is. That took way too many words to explain what I could teach you in a couple of minutes, possibly even under a minute. Once you see this and play this game, it just makes sense when you see it in front of you. Indeed, essentially, it's just a five suit, seven number card game where you're trying to match suits played to collect all seven cards from as many suits as you can. Though I will say they have themed it very well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a painted on theme to an abstract card game. Now, we discovered this game at Origins 2023, where Deanna did a short demo with the game's creator. Now, first off, I have to give Snowbright Studios credit for having one of the most inviting and welcoming booths at the con. This really was something to see, because Deanna did this demo sitting on a park bench surrounded by flowers and vegetation that made you feel like you were chilling in the outdoors. And a very family-friendly area with coloring areas for kids even yeah snowbright prides themselves on being an lgbtq plus game studio dedicated to creating heartwarming games that spark imagination and inspire action and you really got that vibe from the booth now while the booth and people we met were super cool i don't think that gave us any bias towards the game in particular because after just a couple of rounds deanna and i both saw the simplicity and elegance of the game design in birds of a feather this is a super easy to learn game where the mechanics are super well tied to the theme and it all just makes sense together. A game that's fun, well themed and educational as well as environmentally friendly. Yeah. Really hard to find some negatives here on this one. So let's hear the pitch. What is the theme concept? So basically you're birders, so you want to see as many birds as possible. So you're going to have to go to different places, different habitats. You pick which bird you're going to go out looking for but then try to time it so you're there when other birds are there at the same time. After each round, you hear about other birds that were spotted, then you plan your next trip to be sure to catch those lingering birds before they fly away. Like, that, it fits the theme so well. Easy enough sounding, but of course, the count of available birds of each type is limited. Mm. So if you miss one, you may or may not get another chance to find that bird at that habitat. Yeah, my youngest daughter, Genevieve, uh, went on about this aspect of the game, the, the way the theme ties in for two to three days after playing it for the first time. She just kept saying, oh, that game just made sense, Dad. It just that, like, OK, like the eggs are the most common. There's three eggs for each one. Well, that makes sense because they're the easiest to spot, right? The eggs don't move. Everyone can find eggs. It's the flying birds that are hard to find. And the way the raptors scare away the other birds. That's something that might happen to a real birder. You're going to take a picture of your bird and then some other bird scares it away. I, I This, the way the theme tied to this game really cemented the gameplay in her mind. And it has become one of her favorite games because of this. While no birder, I've done enough wildlife photography to feel a familiarity with the theme and concepts that just hits home. Yeah. Now, along with being simple to teach and easy to remember due to the thematic tie-ins, I love that this game plays up to seven players. Now, the more people you play with, it is a better chance of ending up everyone spots all the birds or close to it, and there's a higher chance of the tie. It's still great to have a quick-playing strategic game that plays in under half an hour that plays seven players. Yeah, sitting down in the lobby of the hotel and learning and playing the game in minutes was a nice touch. I'm not good at the game, but it's not because it's hard to learn. I'm also impressed by how well the game did play at lower player counts, uh, especially when you use the proper rules, because in our first few plays, we miss, miss the fact you reveal cards from the deck with playing with two or three. Though I got to say, like the first time Sean played in the hotel lobby there, the game still worked, and I still would be praising the game right now. would still get a positive review, but it is better when you play by the proper rules. Who knew? I especially like the more strategic two and three player variants, having now tried those. They really make the game feel more like a hobby game. 
And I recommend any experienced gamers use those variants as soon as possible. They play one game to kind of get it down, but immediately switch to that drafting system. And if you're playing with more than three players that are gamers and this isn't the first game they played, be sure to use that migration variant. Well, the depth of play from what is essentially a deck of cards here is very impressive. Yeah, I'm glad and and surprised and happy and thank you, Deanna, for convincing me to ask No Bright for a review copy of Birds of a Feather, Western North America. This is an easily overlooked game. I would have walked right by this. And honestly, this is the type of game we love highlighting. This is the kind of stuff I love to review. This is the stuff I like talking about in the hopes that more people hear about it. This is a very solid, quick playing game that does an amazing job of integrating the bird watching theme with card play. And as my daughter says, it just makes sense and it works. Hard to say it better than Jen did. Now, all that said, this is not a deep thinky game. While there is definite strategy and tactics, you need to plan ahead based on your hand and what order you're going to play your cards in, and you're going to have to react to what the other players are doing. This is not a heavy game in any way, and this may be too light for some game groups. That said, it was Deanna, the heavy gamer in our group, who was won over by Birds of a Feather. So even some hardcore gamers may want to give this one a shot. I think that the size, flexibility, and environmental goals of both it and the publisher make this one a worthy game to pick up and keep in your back pocket. Even heavy gamers need some filler now and then, and this can fit the bill. Now, personally, what I want to do, and I'm like, I have no affiliation with these people, except they gave me a review copy, but I want to go ambassador for this game. Now, I don't know how many people know it, but the region of Canada we live in, in southwestern Essex County, is a huge destination spot for birders. It is along one of the biggest migration routes in the entire world. Towns like Kingsville, Ontario, have built their entire industry around birders and seasonal visits. This is the game that I think should be sitting on the shelf at the Bandit Goose Brewery. And it should have been in our hotel room when we stayed at the Grove Hotel. And I should be able to buy a copy on the way to Point Pelee at the local gift shops. Like I just, this, this game, more so than Wingspan, which I have seen in these places, just fits the the casual player in in a much better way and perfectly fits the area in the theme even the birds you're seeing here are birds you can see here indeed well that's it for our look at birds of a feather western north america meaning we can check off play, quick playing thematic card game off of our board game spotting checklist now what's a highly thematic game you've played that just makes sense due to how well the theme is tied to the mechanics comment and tell us about it. I also invite you to head over to the blog where you can spot even more info on Birds of a Feather, including a more detailed overview of play, getting into different bird rarities, and lots of pictures from our gameplays. And now a look at the Siege of Valeria campaign expansion. We'd like to thank Daily Magic Games for providing us both the core game and its expansion to review. The Siege of Valeria campaign expansion and Siege of Valeria itself was designed by friend of the show, Glenn Flaherty, who we know through his Board Games and Bourbon YouTube channel, which I encourage you to check out. It features artwork from who else but the Miko, and as Sean mentioned, was published by Daily Magic Games, coming out last year after a successful Kickstarter for three different small box Valeria games. We reviewed all three of those games. If you care to check them out, look for reviews of Thrones of Valeria, Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, and the winter expansion for it, and of course, Siege of Valeria, on the blog, YouTube, and past podcast episodes. Now, the campaign expansion for Siege of Valeria keeps the single-player count, but significantly increases the game time, as it requires you to play three rounds of the game to complete a full campaign. The setup and takedown times are also increased as it is the time spent between games getting the decks all reset up and between the rounds. The overall game weight also increases a bit as there's quite a bit more to think about when playing a campaign. Now the campaign expansion for Siege of Valeria continues the story from the base game. The Queen of Valeria is impressed with your ability to defend the southern border and has put you in charge of defending the entire kingdom. This is played out through a series of three sieges where your results in one battle will affect the next battle, as well as contributing to an overall score. Other new elements include powerful bosses to defeat, elite troops, enemy commanders, 
dukes who help you defend the walls, and more. Now, for a look at all this new stuff, be sure to check out our Siege of Valeria campaign unboxing on YouTube. There you'll see just how much stuff they managed to stuff into this pretty small box. There's a lot of new stuff here. You've got new Siege Engine cards, a deck full of new bosses to face, a deck of elite troops, enemy commander and duke decks, new champions, new events, penalty and bonus decks, a replacement reference card, and a surprisingly thick rule book that unfortunately comes folded in half in order for it to fit in the book. Speaking of rules, let's move on to an overview of how to use this Siege of Valeria expansion. So the big thing this expansion does is turns what was a single game, solitaire game, into a three game series where the results from each game contribute to a total score and how you do in one game does affect the next. So it's still solitaire, just longer solitaire. Yep. Now, nothing wrong with that, but make sure you're not thinking it's added anything in the way of player count, co-op or anything like that. Now, this expansion also adds quite a few new things, which makes setting up a bit fiddly. Before the first game, you're going to add new cards to your existing cards. That's new champions, events, and siege engines. You just mix these in. Note, they forgot to tell you that in the rule book, but it's pretty obvious. You then set up the game as normal with a few exceptions, like you're going to mix in one boss monster into the bottom of the siege deck, and you're going to add four elite troops to the troop deck. Next, you find out who you're facing in the first battle by drawing a commander, and find out who's helping you by drawing a duke. While using this expansion, you get three starter champions, which you place into your towers now. Normally, when you're playing the main game, you have to earn champions. You start with three. Now, these are pretty powerful champions, but they have one-time use abilities. So once they're used, they're put into the bottom of the deck, but not discarded. Note, if you added the new Siege Engines to the deck, you need to remove seven at the start of the game, not five. This was missed in the rulebook and clarified by the designer on Board Game Geek. Which would be why my first game was ridiculously hard the first time and felt impossible. Make sure you do that one. Note the two new Siege are actually there so you can swap them out for existing ones or put them in. It's up to your choice. At this point, you play Siege of Valeria with a couple extra phases. So after you roll the dice, the enemy commander power goes off. These include nasty things like putting a flame token on a tower of your choice or causing you to discard champion cards. And for those of you not familiar with the base game, that's bad. If you lose a champion or get four flame tokens on one location, that's it. Game over. Now, during the siege engine phase, if the boss is out, it attacks. Each boss has two different attacks, and they're both super nasty. Note that while the boss does activate during the siege engine phase, they aren't considered siege engines for all the other rule purposes. So that does that impact how the bosses move and when they can be hit similar to siege engines, or is it just in the timing? So bosses don't have range ratings like siege engines and move up just as troops do. When the troops in front of them are defeated, they move up at the end of the round. Now they attack every round at whatever range they happen to be at uh, during the siege engine phase, which technically is now called the siege engine and boss phase. So basically they're just an extra troop type that activates at the same time as the siege engines. Now at some point in here, your duke's power may go off. And we got a random duke at the start of the game. And different dukes affect different phases of the game. So, for example, one duke has you draw two event cards during the event phase and pick which one to happen. Which is a good thing, because most of the events are nasty. Another has you roll up one of your red dice during the roll dice phase. The main action phase stays the same, except for the rules for elite troops and bosses. Elite troops each have two battle numbers on them, with a bar under them. This is to remind you that you need to spend dice showing these exact numbers in order to defeat them. Now, as noted earlier, bosses have two attacks. Well, the way it's listed is each attack has its own battle numbers, like defense values or health or whatever you want to call it. And all both of these are going to require strength and magic to, to defeat them, to beat them. So if you spend enough to defeat one of these attacks, you disable it and you get to mark it. There's a new damage token and you put it on top of the card to remind you when it gets to the next uh, siege and boss phase, they won't use that attack. Once you take out the second attack on a boss, that does take it out. So far in all the games I played, there has never been a chance where I could take out both. They just required too many dice, too high a numbers to take out both in one round. If you pulled this off, congratulations. I haven't done it yet. Now, bosses, when you defeat them, unlike siege engines, again, remember, they're not siege engines. You don't get anything. But they are worth points at the end of the game, even if you lose. 
So you're playing three games regardless of losing any of the individual games then? That's correct. Uh, the in individual win and loss conditions don't change in the game. You need to defeat all the siege engines to win, lose if you run out of enemy troops or one of your towers fall or a siege engine reaches your wall, but you are playing three games either way. Now, once you finish a game, you calculate your score, which is one point for defeating the boss and bonus points for surviving the game based on what game number it is. One point for surviving one, three for game three. Now, once you're done, you set up the next round, assuming it's not the third one. If you won, you're going to draw a new boss and enemy commander. You defeated those ones, right? Makes sense. You then get to draw a card from the bonus deck, which will be a one-time use card that you can use in your next battle. Uh, one of the ones I got to see, because I didn't win a lot of these, was shuffle through the enemy troop deck and draw two cards and add it to your hand. Now, if you do defeat the boss but lose the battle, you're still going to face the same commander. They defeated you, but you will need to draw a new boss. And, well, you're going to have to draw a new duke because you lost and your duke died. You also then have to draw a penalty card. This happens right at the start of the game in the first round after you roll your dice and includes some form of penalty. Uh, when I first played, one of my red troops, my red dice ran away, deserted me. Great, thanks. If you fail completely, you replace your duke, face the same boss, face the same commander, and have to deal with a penalty card. Now, the fascinating part here is, of course, the fact that losing one battle doesn't mean you've lost the war. Well, yes, a perfect score at the end, where you win every battle and defeat every boss, does make you the hero of Valeria, and they throw holidays in your name. They name, name, name a holiday after you. You only actually need six points for the second best result. And even a result of three points is a partial victory. So what did you think of campaign? I know we both liked but didn't love Siege of Valeria. Does this improve it? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, the new elements here of elite troops, bosses, starting champions, enemy commanders, and dukes bring Siege of Valeria to another level, another complexity level, and honestly, interest level. It's just more going on and more interesting things going on and more things to think about and ways to make combos. Well, that's certainly welcome, in large part because neither of us are solo gamers. I think there wasn't enough of a game there in the base set for us to want yeah. to take the trouble of setting it up and playing. Having a bit more game to the game changes that calculation. Yeah, there is a ton of stuff here. Like, you only use one boss per fight. Uh, technically, you might use the same boss three times if you play badly enough, but you get seven in the box. You're only mixing in four elite troops each game, but the campaign box comes with 16. There are 10 different enemy commanders. There are 10 different dukes. You also got new events and new champions that just get tossed in the mix. All of this helps make the game more variable. While I found the original game starts to feel repetitive, especially if you play a bunch of games in a row, like three, that's relieved a lot with this expansion. Indeed, a definitely an increase in replayability, even though you're now playing three games at a time instead of just one. Now that said, the basic gameplay is the same. It, this is still Siege of Valeria. It still feels like Siege of Valeria. This is still a puzzle game in the end where you're trying to figure out the best use of your dice and cards every round and doing your best to set up combos that let you take out multiple troops or siege engines in one round. As we mentioned earlier, it's still a solitaire game, if longer one than previously. And that length is my biggest concern with this expansion. It turns what was a half-hour game into a two-hour game if you play through all campaign games in one sitting. The additional setup and teardown required before, after, and between rounds is significant. You are having to sort all the decks out every time and rebuild them, reshuffle them. As one example, the troop deck. Start of the game, you're going to have to separate all the elite cards from the normal cards because they probably mixed in from the last game unless when you cleaned up you did this. You're then going to shuffle both those decks, the troop deck and the elite troop deck. You're going to take two cards off the standard deck, remove them from the game, put them back in the box. You're then going to deal your two self two cards as your starting hand. Then you're going to lay out the grid, the, the four by five grid, 20 cards out on the table. Then you're going to take the deck and remove four more cards from the game and put them in the box. Then you're going to draw four cards from the other deck, the elite deck. Then you're going to shuffle those into the basic deck. Like that's all the steps just to prepare one of the decks in the game. 
prepping the siege deck is similar. And even like just finding the three starter champions and recognizing the one logo on them takes some time. Just all of this is a lot more fiddly prep work. Yeah, the setup does sound a bit onerous. Though I expect it's similar to what a lot of solo players need to do for games, so not totally out of line if that is your preferred gaming experience. Yeah, fair enough. I haven't really played enough different solo games myself to really compare the amount of setup time. Uh, most of my solo experience are simple card games like Friday or Ona Rim. So compared to those, there's a lot of work. Now, my other complaint about Siege of Valeria campaign is, is one you've probably heard me mention on the show now multiple times of miss expectations to a little bit. Because when I heard campaign, I thought RPG campaign. I thought story. I thought ongoing, evolving story. What they mean by Siege of Valeria campaign is military campaign. You are playing through a three battle military campaign and not an RPG style campaign. Yes, there is some background info and yeah, the, the, the different end game scores give you a little story. You know, you get to have a holiday named after you, but it's no more than you'd expect in any board game. This is in no way adding any RPG stuff. So uh, we've reviewed other games as well that if not solo are still single game experiences with campaigns that just change the setup some and involve playing it multiple times with very little story other than a light paste on. Yeah. I think it's something that many games are trying to capitalize on, but as shown here can perhaps fail if expectations aren't set well. Overall, I was really impressed by how much Siege of Valeria was improved by adding the campaign expansion. I can't really see playing Siege without it going forward. Now, the one thing I think people may want to do, which isn't mentioned in the book at all, but I think should be, is to use all of this stuff to just play a single game. Draw a boss, draw a commander, give yourself a duke, shuffle in some elite troops, toss in a boss, and just play. Certainly no reason why you can't add it all in now that you've got it. If you own Siege of Valeria and enjoy it at all, you really should pick up the campaign expansion. It really does improve the base game and needs to be added to our growing list of must-have board game expansions. Now, if you were like Sean and I and thought Siege of Lair was good, but not something we could see ourselves playing all that often, you might want to pick this expansion up. I can definitely see myself playing more campaigns in the future. That being said, it's still a solo game, and some people prefer the social aspects of gaming. This certainly isn't going to open the game up to those people. In the end, Siege of Valeria is still Siege of Valeria, even with the campaign expansion. And if mathy puzzles are not what you want out of a fantasy siege game, this expansion isn't going to win you over. Despite the name, it doesn't add any story or RPG elements to this solo dice and card game. Well, that's it for our look at the Siege of Valeria campaign expansion. Are there any games who've expanded from single adventure to campaign that you enjoy? Comment and tell us all about it below. Now, I gave a pretty high-level overview of play here. If you want more details on exactly how the campaign expansion for Siege of Valeria works and the actual setup involved for each game step-by-step, step, please check out my written review over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Finally, if you enjoyed this review, please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. And now in the Bellhop's Tabletop, we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, first one is something that's probably going to surprise some people, and that is multiple rounds of Tapple with the kids and some games that Deanna joined in as well. Now, I played this game years ago at a public play event at Brimstone Games. John Salalila, someone Sean and I both know from grade school, had brought the game out, and it was a huge hit. I have been making my name. Blah, blah, blah. I have been meaning to pick up a copy of this and finally did it at Origins. Thank you, the op, for letting us bring a copy home. Just remember, it takes batteries. Yeah, that'll probably be a pretty amusing unboxing video when we release it. I've recorded it, and I had no clue. And honestly, in my head, I thought the game was mechanical, not electronic. But whatever, it is what it is. Uh, there's some neat stuff going on in that game besides like the gameplay. I, I love how compact it is, and like the cards for the game snap into the bottom, which is just really cool. It, it's very toyetic. I, I knew that going in. And I like the fact that this is one of the few games where, like, my box is gone. I recycled it. Like, I can't even put it in the backdrop because I got rid of it because there's no reason to keep it. Um, the only complaint I have is the volume. I, I really wish there was a volume slider somehow or possibly a way to mute it and it vibrate instead. 
Yeah, that is one of those uh, toyrific aspects. Kids, games, and toys like that. That's one of those ones where people, parents let the batteries run out. <laughs> yes. And it won't play without it. Like, like uh, uh, huh? it? I guess you could. I don't know how you do it with the timer, but you could probably still, like, play with the toy. Anyway, for anyone who hasn't played Tapple, it, it's, it's uh, I don't know, what do you call it? A letter game? A word game? A spelling game? I don't even know what you call it. But you get a card, and it has a category on it. And then it, it, what you have to do is you have to say a word that matches that category and hit the first letter of that word. And then you tap the middle and it goes to the next player. And the next player has to hit a different letter, say it, say a different word, hit the letter, tap the thing, hit the letter, tap the thing. And what it is, is it's doing a 10 second timer in between any of this. And if at any point you haven't hit a letter yet and hit the thing, it buzzes and you're out of the game and it's last player standing. Yes, it has player elimination, but you're not going to care when you play this game. It, it's silly, fun. It's toyetic. Um, it's a little better design than I thought because it doesn't have like 26 letters. It skips a bunch of the hard to use letters. I, it's just a neat game. This is really a game. I, I knew it as a game that we used to play around the campfire where yeah. you would, you know, you'd pick a theme and you'd say a word and someone would have to start the word with the last letter of the word yeah. the last person did. It's the same sort of game. There's a, a lot of different variants of it. This is just basically a physical version of that, you know, campfire game. Yeah, my kids loved it, like really loved it. I I was shocked by how much fun they had, especially because like I brought it as the game to play while we were waiting for dinner to be ready before we sat down to play the real game. And they just kept playing with it. And what was amusing is very shortly, there was just the two of them playing around with it because I got a little tired of it. And they did what we did at Brimstone. They tossed out the cards and they were doing warrior cat clans and warrior cat names and favorite sci-fi authors and, and wizard spells and stuff like that. It is a fun game. At some point, I'll review it. It will fit it in at some point. Like I, I could review it now. I kind of almost did right here. But we'll do it. We'll do a formal one. And in, in thanks for uh, for the off letting us bring a copy home. We'll we'll get you a you know a, a, a YouTube segment of <laughs> me gushing on about Tapple. So I'm still going to complain it's not mechanical. I hear video. So this to me in my head was was wind up like you you hit this and it slowly clicked and then timed out which it doesn't and i don't quite understand this design if that's not what it did like why why is this round thing everywhere so it still kind of baffles me so yes there is my copy of tapple that wanted to take a dive i forgot it was rested up on something so i still haven't played it yet due to the uh, various health issues going around but the concept is pretty straightforward and i i think i could probably uh get through the review on this one without getting my hands yeah. on it you you could probably review it yourself without having ever played it no <laughs> we don't do that all right speaking of getting to the real game we brought tapple over until dinner is ready had dinner and then we sat down to more castle panic we're getting there we're going to review this at some point um i think this is an example of us going above and beyond what anyone expects but i want to play each of the expansions at least once before i review the big box because that's the whole point so at this point, we have tried the Wizard's Tower, which we talked about before. And now we have tried the Dark Titan. Dark Titan was pretty cool. Um, I'm reminded a bit of the campaign expansion for Seeds of Valeria, because one of the things it adds is a big boss that can show up at any time who had some ridiculous heavy metal sounding name and artwork. Uh, the cool part is this, this is an eight health monster that you have to fight. So if anyone plays Castle Panic knows how dang tough it is to do eight damage and it does terrible things and it does terrible things like every round when it's going to move, you like roll a die to see what it does. And most of what it does is affects the other monsters on the board and makes them do stuff as well as slowly advancing on its own. Um, the cool part they did with this that I really like is it comes in multiple levels. Now they tell you level zero is for kids. So the level zero version is it does nothing. When you roll the die, it just, it advances, right? It's nothing fancy. Well, as you add levels, it starts doing more stuff like portaling flaming rocks and stuff. And what's kind of neat is, is the big box includes the promo version, which is level six. I guess like if you bought this expansion, it goes up to level five. Well, this includes the extra hard level six because some people who play Castle Panic are masochists. Now, along with the big boss, you also get new monster tiles. Um, our absolute favorite new monster tile is the uh, the ogre with the bomb on his back because we won a game by the last monster on the board being the ogre who just ran into our last wall and exploded, which was just fun. Um, there's some powerful new castle cards. 
What I like to see out of these is ones that let you team up. There's a card called Barrage where every, you pick an arc and everyone can spend all their cards. I thought that was a nice addition to the game. Um, there's one that lets you put a Cavalier on the map. So you get like a little mini that you put out of Standy uh, that you put on the map. And every round after you've played all your cards, you can then move the Cavalier and have it fight monsters for you, which was neat. That adds really a whole new level to the game. My favorite part, though, of Dark Titan, though, is what they called support tiles. These are three tiles that go in the monster bag, but they re they're good things. They represent support from other uh, nearby kingdoms that are being sent in, and they show up in the forest randomly, just like the monsters, and you have to move these closer to the castle by discarding hit cards. They move one square for any hit card, and if you play one that's the right color, they move two. And your goal is to get them to your castle, and if you do, you get this huge bonus. Or you can actually use them to fight some of the monsters that are out there. But these aren't very tough. And what it is, like, one will have a strength of three. And by the time it gets to the castle, you can do three damage to any monsters anywhere on the board. Well, if it gets hit on the way in, it does less damage. So if it's at two health when it reaches, you only do one, two damage. If it's at one health when it reaches the castle, it does one. It's interesting how this game went from, oh, God, do we have to play this at its <laughs> basic mode to this is cool. Though that's not to say there are not still some issues. Yeah, one of the whole thing with this is 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 what Sean's saying. It went from this simple quick game, uh, the, like quick cooperative family game, moving it more into a gamer's game, which I, I'm assuming was the goal of these expansions. Like the medium to heavyweight gamer in me digs this. What I'm not loving is that it just keeps making the game longer with our games now averaging over an hour and a half with some games going over two hours. And it just, I no longer have that quick castle panic game. Let's, let's get tuned games in tonight. Let's see how we do this, this quick, sometimes stressful, silly, fun game. And the more expansions we add, the less quick it is. And now my problem as a gamer who has a large collection of games and likes a variety of games is once you get to a two hour slot to put games in, there are many other games, in my collections that I think I'd rather be playing for that wrong. I'm not sure if making Castle Panic more of a gamer's game is what I want from Castle Panic. Though at the same time, the base game was so almost horrifically unbalanced, <laughs> I can see the drive to make it more of a real game. Uh, I think the real problem we're having is that we just don't have the time to dedicate to hours of long games these days. And when we yeah. do, they need to be more meaningful, which Castle right. Panic, to be fair, has never pretended to be. Yeah, I feel like if I'm going to spend two hours playing a game, I want to determine who at the table was the better player. And, you know, I want that competition and not a, a silly dice chucker. And to be fair, that is something that's now part of the game that wasn't there before. Is there are now monsters you have to roll dice to hit? I don't know. At this point, we still have two more expansions to go. I'm honestly worried it's just going to keep growing and becoming more complicated and more long. Um, maybe it'll get to that point where it's now complicated enough. It feels like playing a medium weight Euro. So it'll fit that slot better. Or maybe the later expansions will bring back more of the feel of the original. I suspect they won't, but it's not impossible. Uh, next up playing birds of the feather with Genevieve at Kava and LaSalle, which went really well. This was her first time playing. And as noted in the review, she loved the game due to how well the theme integrated, which worked really well in particular with her combination of learning disabilities. We also played it again on Sunday with the extended family, which also went over really well. Yeah, I'm great to hear this game is getting the player love it deserves. Hopefully we can get help get the knowledge about it out there. Yeah, what do we, I think what we need to do is we need to go to Banded Goose and play it. But then again, I just, I, where do we get it? I'll have to Google it. I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Here. Uh, well, like Kava, we also uh, play, I taught um, Genevieve Star Realms. Um, using the new Frontiers box, which we brought back from Origins. Thanks, Wise Wizard. Um, I expected her to dig it because she's a sci-fi spaceship, Star Trek, Star Wars kind of kind of fan, fanboy. Um, and I was a little worried she'd have a hard time picking it up because there are quite a few moving parts. And I the, the, the second part, no problem. She picked it up right away. I actually thought with the large decision space, 
she she'd be a little overwhelmed but not at all like she knew to buy bases and she she made a combo a yellow combo she immediately picked up on the if i buy cards of the same color they get better and and spent things where she had five to buy but bought nothing because it would clog her deck like she really got it i was impressed by that now she did have deck building experience from my little pony i don't know if she's playing any other deck builder but as we said before my little pony is a pretty heavy deck builder so I, i shouldn't have been surprised the thing is, I hear I'm expecting like like Star Realms. Honestly, one of in my opinion, one of the best games we own, especially for two player dueling games. It's my favorite. I thought she'd like it, but she liked Birds of a Feather more, and that's what she wanted to play again the next day. Birds beat spaceships. Maybe not in my world, but hey, <laughs> generally not in hers either. Um, speaking of playing games, with my daughters. As far as my other daughter goes, I have been playing Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Uh, exploring the new expansion, but I really don't have anything more to say I didn't cover in the review, other than Gwen was really impressed by how much more stuff was in there since the last time the two of us played together. And she just, again, pointed out how much she really enjoys this game. Now, if only we had a decent way of organizing it from the publisher. Something to add to the quality of life, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I still, I, I, I came up with a new way to sort the cards now in the box that exists. I now have it sorted because you can fit three decks together in one of the slots. It's now sorted by expansion because I know what characters came in which expansion. So it's now a little easier for me to find stuff. But yeah, it's still not optimum. And I think one more, ex- I, I, I think I have room for two more 10 card decks and that's it. Um, On my own, I spent some time exploring Siege of Laria and prep for tonight's review. Um, Again, I don't think I have anything to add to that. Um, the other thing though, speaking of tonight's reviews is I had fully planned on reviewing something completely different. I was not, I wanted to do at the ready cause it just came out this weekend, but I wasn't planning on doing anything else from origins. I wasn't going to do birds of the feather this week. I was fully expecting to review something called the intrism mini. And I think I brought this up. I don't know if it was at the end of the last episode or during the pre-show, but this is a, a marble run, a, a, a labyrinth, marble labyrinth puzzle, 3D, that you build yourself. And well, it, I, for those live, I apologize for you at home. This is as far as I got. And it's kind of neat and impressive, but very fiddly. Then a piece broke. And there are no spares included with the Intrism Mini. And despite the fact everywhere in the instruction book says, just go to this website for free piece replacement, the free piece replacement does not include shipping. And they're using Shopify. And anyone in Canada who's ever tried to buy anything from Shopify knows just how bad the shipping is. And I'm sorry, I am not going to pay that price for a replacement part for a review copy of a game. Nor would I be happy to have spent the $80 the game costs and then being asked to pay a quarter of that to ship one piece. So I don't know where this is going. I have written my contact there. I have asked how they want to proceed. This might be one of the few cases where I do not review a product. Because right now, my review will not be positive in any way, shape, or form. Uh, Sean caught some of the live unboxing. It's up on Twitch if people want to see it was not the most enjoyable build I've ever done, ending in the frustration of a piece breaking. Yeah, so even, this might be one... even up until that, that piece broke, this was still looking pretty rough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've yeah. watched you build a lot of things now, and, and this one was not the not pleasant. Yeah, it, it's for expert modelers only with lots of patient and and things like arms to hold things and maybe an extra set of hands. I don't know. So this might be it. This may be the review in Trism gets. Um, hopefully that uh, we get to an amicable situation and they send the piece. I finish the build, um, which still is going to say for expert builders, like there are lots of these wooden puzzles. And this reminds me of the, you know, the ones you see at the, uh, it's not even hobby stores, like the, like the, the, the hobby stores that aren't game stores where it's like build this working clock out of wood with little tiny pieces. It's, it's more that level compared to building an escape puzzle. <laughs> so that's it for what we have been playing. What about what we plan to play next? Any gaming plans for the coming week? What I really want to do is I want to have a Sean con. I don't know if that works into Sean's schedule. I know currently it does not work into our budget. Uh, this month's going to be rough. Um, plus, Deanna is still not 100%. She's still struggling with respiratory issues. So I don't know if that's possible, but like, 
man, we need to like, just get a weekend to playing games. We need to uh, the kapow sitting <laughs> here, like the stuff I've unboxed seas of havoc. Like there's just so many games that we brought back from origins that we need to play so we can review them. Uh, I'd like to give out a shout out to lucky newt games for reaching out and thanking me for supporting them on itch.io uh, by sending me a finished full color version of a superhero's journey, uh, which is a cool six uh, D six pool RPG, only nine pages of rules and tables, but with a lot of play potential. Uh, I had sent them a few bucks for their free early release version on, on itch.io. Um, okay. when I heard about it on the app, formerly known as Twitter, uh, and they reached out to me today saying, thanks for sending us a few bucks. We got the full version. Here you go. Have a copy so oh that's cool yeah. um otherwise uh, we're still working on stuff we had in the pile of obligation before origins um so we still have a couple murder mystery games and interestingly it seems people who entered our giveaway are looking for more murder mystery escape room content so we do have two more um i have whatever's gonna happen next with intrism mini and hopefully um we can get back together with sean and get some viticulture worlds play in now, I have unboxed even more stuff, and from the most recent pile, I'm expecting Kapow to hit the table first out of what's left. No disagreement there. <laughs> now, as for next week's show, uh, we're actually planning ahead a bit, which means something's going to happen. We're going to have to cancel or something. But uh, expect us to be sharing our favorite pub games, or at least I'll be sharing my favorite pub games. Uh, board games, great for playing at pubs, bars, and breweries, and sharing reviews of Shobu, Psychobabble, and maybe the Deadlies, if I can get in a few more plays of that one before next week. Before we start locking things down, let's take a moment to thank a selection of our Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patrons. Their support has kept this show going for five years so far, with a lot more to come. Dukas, thank you. Ron F., thank you, Ron. Roger Malach, thank you, Roger. David Miller Jr., thank you. Brian Kurtz, our first ever patron. Always appreciated. Thank you, Brian. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web, it's Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Keep the conversation going by joining us on the Tabletop Bellhop Discord at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. That's all for us tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us live, and be sure to stick around for the Penthouse Suite after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.